Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Fuel Flows box set review and discussion. I am Fuel Flows 409. I am, my name is Scott, um, but better known as Fuel Flows 409 on a bunch of uh, social media platforms, including YouTube and Instagram. And I have with me here my buddy, DJ Kenter. Say hello, DJ. Introduce hey, yourself. Hey, what's going on, guys? DJ, DJ is a musician himself. He is in a great Beach Boys inspired band called Rattleshake, which you should really check out. They are on Spotify. Go check them out. Uh, highly recommend their music. Uh, and DJ, let's talk about Feel Flows because please, <laughs> that's what we're here for. And this was a major release and it went through so many uncertain periods where like was it gonna come out was it gonna get canceled yeah. were certain tracks gonna be on it all this stuff and this went on for like almost two years or pretty much like practically two years i feel like um the set has been in production like you know been in planning and worked on since 2019 and there was a period where like it wasn't gonna come out um, yeah. there was that whole online petition that started, which I added my name to, and I believe you did too. Um, <laughs> and now it's here. It's physically in our hands. I have my copy right here. I also have the vinyl copy behind me, but to actually hold this thing in our hands is amazing as hardcore yeah. Beach Boys fans. And we just want to spend this particular review not just discussing everything Feel Flows related, but geeking out to this stuff because we like talking about the Beach Boys here. This is so, cool. DJ, um, the way that I thought we might handle this is maybe we should go uh, disc by disc, track by track, with the exception of the albums where I don't think we need to go track by track per se, but um, I do want to comment on like the remastering of the albums overall. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so disc number one is Sunflower, which has been remastered. This is not a remixed album. There are no remixes here. The original mixes by Stephen Desper are still kept intact. They have not been messed with. Um, I found that the, the remaster of Sunflower in particular kind of sounds a little bit like it brought out the bottom end of the, the sound, the overall sound of the tracks where you hear more of the bassy parts. What did you think? No, I agree with you. I think that's kind of been a consensus amongst everyone is that there's definitely more bass, a lot more low end. I think some people like it, some people don't. I noticed it really with the vinyl. Mm -hmm. um, like I had, to, I had to shut my subwoofer off because it was like a little too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, Desper's mix on those uh, on that album is incredible. I, I I totally get like they didn't. I I personally think it's kind of cool to do a new mix when you do a big archival release. But also like I get why they didn't really want to touch it too much because it's it's perfect. It's fantastic. It fits the record so well. It's perfect, and also like Stephen Desper has been very clear that he does not want people messing with the mixes. Yeah. It's not what Carl would have wanted. It's not what he wants. Things were presented in a very specific way that he wants listeners to experience and Carl wanted listeners to experience. So, you know, I, I very much respect that in this case. There are albums, I think, that would, you know, in the Beach Boys discography that, in my opinion, could use a little bit of remixing here and there. Nothing too drastic, but I feel like there are a few albums where I'm like, eh, I'd like to hear this with a different mix potentially. But this is not like Sunflower and Surf's Up for the most part, not yeah. those that like don't fall in that category for me at all. I think Love You is at the top of my list of like, probably should remix that at some point. <laughs> I would love to hear Love You. Gosh, that sounds weird, but yeah. like the, the, the sound of that sentence. But um, I would love to hear it with like pet sounds, orchestral arrangements instead of the synths. The synths give it that charm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine, like, oh, Betty is nice with the orchestration of pet sounds. Same song, same arrangements, just not synths, actual, like, Wrecking Crew-style orchestral instruments. Wouldn't that be awesome? 
Well, there you go. That's Beach Boys Royal Philharmonic uh, Volume 2. Well, well yeah. <laughs> exactly. That needs to happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I fall into that category where I like hearing that low end. To me, that was always a complaint of mine on some of the earlier mixes of Sunflower I heard. It's just a little bit too top heavy, not enough bass. And so I like that. Um, but your mileage, of course, will vary. Uh, but I definitely found it to my liking. Yeah, um, I think it's a good one. And so actually, instead of just reaching behind me, I'm going to bring this up. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking that I'm like, are you just going to reach behind you every time we do it? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, 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 good old Wikipedia <laughs> saving me <laughs> from doing that. Um, but the, the bonus tracks. So um how it goes is, you know, they have the album proper. At the end of the album proper sequence, there's actually like a promo for Sunflower, which is really cool to hear. When I heard that, and I heard a snippet of it like late last year when like the 1970 release, as they called it, was dropped on the internet and then mm -hmm. <laughs> removed. But um, some fans thankfully like managed to get a hold of that and like re upload them. So um, but I thought that was cool. It's a similar thing, really, to what they did with the Smile Sessions, where they had that hidden track at the end for the physical. I, I think it was only, the, what, the was it on the two CD set? It was definitely, on, of course, on the five CD set. That much I know. Yeah. One, in fact. It was? I It definitely was on the, um, well, yeah, I, I don't have any of the CD sets. I trust you. I've heard oh. it. I've heard it, so it's on something. Yeah, <laughs> so it's not on, like, the Spotify version. Spotify doesn't yeah, yeah, yeah. have um bonus promo snippets but um if you ha actually have like the physical copy of the cds they do have that at the end of disc one it's really cool to hear and i loved hearing it this time around too um for they did that box. with the pet sounds box set too yep the they one did from that the 90s, right yeah yeah they also did um actually this might be one of the same but they did it with um pet sounds with like carl that little radio promo they did oh yeah 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 Mm -hmm. one of those tracks so i like that um it's just a snapshot in time and you know both you and me are younger fans um so getting to hear that old stuff is really cool um you know not mind-blowing but really neat yeah oh yeah um, yeah reminds so, me a lot of there's a um one of those like super deluxe versions of the blade runner soundtrack and there are mm -hmm. these like S similar thing where it's like a promo for it but it's all um it's not a trailer for the movie it's for the soundtrack and i've always found that interesting it reminds me a lot of that where it's just kind of like these two people just talking about the beach boys and how they're like new and they have a new sound and it's interesting to hear how they were marketed in the 70s like what people at that time would have been like told essentially they were doing you know Oh, yeah. And it continues with the Surf's Up promo, but we'll get there a little bit later. But that one really struck out, uh, stuck out to me as like, oh, this is a new marketing thing. Like, it's, it's really in your face, I feel like, with the Surf's Up one especially. Not in your face in a bad way, but just like more noticeable and upfront how they're marketed versus in the past. Yeah. Um, but the set goes on and elsewhere later on in the first uh, first disc of the cd set we have the sunflower live tracks now these tracks were like taken from all different eras post sunflower basically it's a little bit jarring to hear it like in chron chronological order um because you get so many different styles because yeah. there are so many different eras that the tracks are taken from the first one is this whole world which was um from a live performance in 1988 what did you think of that did you have any specific oh, i loved it carl's <sighs> carl always kills it like no matter what even uh, that's that's the thing i love about carl it could be the worst song in the world it could be problem child and he just he gives it 100 percent, man and and you gotta love him for it and that's a a really great version of that song i love that they were just pulling that out too like it was from 88 right 
1988, which is so that's right before Kokomo, before right? Rarities, half a decade before the Rarities uh, series of concerts in 1988. Yeah, they were just pulling that out. And I, I, I love that. I think that's really good. Cool. And I, I like, I, I will talk about this a little more. Those rarity shows, I didn't really know they existed. I knew that because they had a couple of live cuts from that on the 50th uh, Pet Sound. Uh, made in California, right? Well, yeah, Made in California too. I forgot about that. But they had, I know like You Still Believe in Me from 93 is on the Pet Sounds one. Yeah. I Can we put those shows out? Can we just put the whole shows out? I, I want to hear, this is my plea to Mark Lennon, not Boyd. <laughs> Fake sign here, petition. Petition. I love that. What, the, what I imagine the, the logic is, is we're so far away from like releasing anything that was from like the 90s. Summer in Paradise era. Yeah. So it's like, um, let's just take this here and there from the later. Which is smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While, we're all, while we're all living. <laughs> Let's not wait for the uncertain future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I imagine there's a little bit of that potentially going on, but yes, I'm of the same mind. All of it should be released. And if it's not going to be released all at once, all of it should be released, you know, within it, a when the when it fits the period. I I you know what I, I was gonna do this and I haven't. I want to look up the set list for those shows and just see what else we can expect from like, is there any so tough and holland stuff that's on there that we're gonna hear, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I have never actually like looked at a full set list yeah. from those. I know they exist. I know a lot of the songs that were performed, but I never like completely looked that up and kept track of, oh, that's interesting. They played X, Y, Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I did read, and this was on a Facebook group that I'm a member of, um, Facebook fan group for the Beach Boys. Um, somebody mentioned, I think, that this whole world the 88, or maybe it was Smiley Smile. I don't know, somewhere somewhere on the internet where, where people talk about the Beach Boys elsewhere other than this, um, that it's this performance of this whole world was actually taken from like a medley performance oh. from 88. Huh. And uh, I found that interesting, actually. I wonder what the other songs in that medley were. Yeah, me too. Can I Can I take a second just to look that up? Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Because I I had screenshotted Mark Lynette in some form said the specific days or the specific shows where those live recordings are from. Okay. Yeah, he did. So that's Smiley Smile. But you know what? DJ, I got some bad news. Smiley Smile has been down for unknown reasons since Saturday night, I think. Wait, Saturday are you serious? That's so interesting. I did try to log on there the other day and it was being weird. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I I I literally have been trying to log in there since like, you know, Sunday early morning. I'm like, I screenshotted it. I screenshotted it. Good. Uh, This whole world. That is serendipitous, DJ. (laughs) I have my moments. Mm -hmm. All right. Beach Boys. Six. Okay. <laughs> the note, uh, the website I'm on says one of the last concerts that did not feature Kokomo. <laughs> um, I, all right. So it doesn't look like it was, I'll send you the link. It, it seems like it's in between California dreaming and don't worry, baby. So I don't know if it was part of it. They also played Hushabai at this show. Yeah, they did. So Hushabai was played quite a bit in the late 80s, early 90s. That's awesome. That's a great song. I wish they would play it actually in real life, to be honest. Like I grew up on the the 93 Good Vibrations box set. That that was the box set that introduced me to the band and made me like a super fan as a kid. Nice. So like that performance, you know, the 19, 1964 performance of Hushabai on that box, you know, the one I'm talking about? I don't, not off the top of my head. That got played in my household growing <laughs> up so much. Sick. And it's just like spine tingling. Amazing. That's a good uh, song to like exercise your voice to. Mm-hmm. You're trying to really push yourself up there. It's a good one. Oh, absolutely. Um. 
That's so cool. That's it, so so weird. It, well, actually, wait a minute. So DJ, I just noticed this. I apologize. On Wikipedia, good old Wikipedia, they actually have it. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm no, you're cool, man. Yeah. Um, this whole world from June 19th, 1988, performed in Groton, Connecticut. I grew up in Connecticut, so that's cool. Um, wait, 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 say that again. Oh, yeah, Groton, Connecticut. Yeah, that's right. June 19th, 1988, Groton, Connecticut. The 93 shows were uh, in Peekskill. Nice. Which is, you know, fairly close. Well, you mean one of them or? The one that, so the one that Take a Load Off Your Feet and Add Some Music to Your Day are from. Okay. Are at the Paramount Center of the Arts from Peekskill in November of 1993. Because here on Wikipedia, and again, this is. Oh, well, actually, is this sourced? Oh, yeah. It's it's sourced through the Smiley Smile thread, which we can't view. But I trust uh -huh. that whoever did this actually actually got the information right and transcribed it correctly from Mark Lynette. Um, but, yeah, yeah it's uh, November 26th, 1993 in New York City. Awesome. Is added to the music to your day, which is the next track on this uh, this particular disc of the, of yeah. the box set and the CD version. Um, Thoughts on this one? I mean, it's the rarities. It's one of the rarities performances. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's such a... I'm surprised that was never a song that they continued to do live. Like, it's such a beautiful song. I love when they would do it in the in the reunion tour, when they would mm -hmm. kind of come out at the, in the second half of the show and they would do that. Um, Around Brian's piano, that was... Oh, it was so great. Perfect. It's so great. And and it's a beautiful song and... Pretty much everyone except Dennis gets is sings lead on it, right? It's everyone but Dennis. Yep, Dennis is on it, but he's like yeah, yeah. Passing lead. He doesn't get a line though. There, yeah, but he, uh, it's a great song. I don't think I've ever heard a version of it that I'm like, Ugh. you know what I mean? It's just one of those. It's just beautiful. It's a great song. It is beautiful. Um, I personally have never like been a an, a super fan of it, but I've always liked it. And so this is no different. I like this a lot. You know what made uh, me realize I like love that song was when they did uh, when David Beard had everyone like re-record it. Oh yes, the California and, music. One. Yeah, for some reason, like it just it would not leave my head. And then I like would go back and listen to the the Sunflower version. And I was like, God, this song is just it's it so is. good. It's like ugh, it's, I don't know. It's just beautiful, and the lyrics are great and. I yeah, we're, I I'm gonna jump ahead for like two seconds. The yeah. the version of of add some music that's on here with the other lyrics is fascinating to me. I'm so glad they put that on there mm -hmm. because I they're they're not bad. They're just like different, and it's so yeah. it's so cool to like when you're expecting something to show up and it's just a, it throws you off a little bit. You're like this is this is why I like archival releases to see like the process of like making the song, you know. We're going to talk a lot about that as we, we will. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, but like, I'm glad you brought it up now because it is on topic. Yeah. Um, but like there are versions where I feel the exact same way of other songs. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of prefer this in certain cases. Depends. Oh, on this box set? Well, yeah, uh, we'll get to okay, that. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. I'm curious. When we get to that, but there are certain versions of certain songs I prefer a lot of them are like surfs up songs. I will say, I think. Okay. Um, if memory serves the the specific versions, I'm like, yeah, I like this. I, I can think of more than one um, that are on surfs up. I can't think of as many that are I uh, was uh, that are on sunflower. Yeah. So uh, next track, Susie Cincinnati, a 1976 performance. I don't they like this the single. This single before the box set dropped. You said you don't like it. Weird. I don't like the song. No, it's always it's an, kind of always annoyed me. <laughs> so, my one of my friends, my, my one of my good friends, um, he he heard this. He had never heard the song before before um, it dropped as a single, like in the weeks preceding sure, yeah. the release of the box set. He had never heard the song before. He heard the live version that they released first time. Loved it, and mm. I'm like. That's great. I'm glad you like it, but I'm, I was so like underwhelmed. By yeah, it's it. fine. It's Why are you releasing this as a single? And this is no disrespect to Al or anybody who was involved in that track. I actually do think it's a fun track and an endearing song, but ultimately 
as a live performance of it. Yeah, it's kind of whatever. Mm, yeah, it's like it's it's not bad, but just kind of blah. Especially if you're giving us like select performances from all of the years. Why why, why the cut? Good yeah. question. And why is it a single and I don't know. Maybe I think maybe that had, that was more of a band politics thing. Maybe Al was like cuz they um there was one interview I watched with Mark and Alan where somebody asked like of the Beach Boys which one is gives the most input. And and yeah, they were like, "Wow!" Exact interview. Al. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it wouldn't surprise me if he was like, "Put this as the single." And they were like, "All right, fine." You know. <laughs> that was actually I know it's a, it's just a shout out here. Beach Boys Talk, the live stream that, that was. Was that, that Beach Boys Talk? I those guys are awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that was the one where he said that. I think it was Matt or Greg, one of them, that actually asked about like he mentioned Bruce, and he was like, uh, "Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah." So it had to. Have been. It was like, yeah, not so much Bruce because he's not a BRI, BRI board member, but Al. That's right. Yeah. So Greg yeah. is so nice. I have not talked to Matt yet, but Greg and I have exchanged oh, yeah. conversation. He's very, very sweet, and it's very he good. Should show. be watching this by the time, <laughs> by the time this uh, is seen by a lot of people, and on replay too, potentially. Yeah, he could be. <laughs> um maybe we'll see um, but yeah he's a great they're both outstanding i mean i love i love beach boys talks to uh, talk to that yeah. i'm talking too fast beach boys talk i love them shout out to them they do awesome 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 interviews and live streams and if you're a beach boys fan and you're watching this and you've never checked out those streams please do please do and, and i'm, I'm finally chat, able, so i like, used to work tuesday nights now i'm able to watch the stream this week i'm very excited for it awesome well actually no not this week oh are they not doing one this week oh, we well we're getting off track a little, we are a little. Getting <laughs> back home is the next track on the set okay i i i was just gonna say because we were talking about Susie cincinnati I don't like 15 big ones. It might be my least favorite Beach Boys album. Mine too. It's just always, fr it's just a very frustrating album, especially because like, It's Okay could have been a huge hit. It's a great song, could have been a hit. There's some good stuff on there. Back Home was always a song I didn't like, mainly because I associated it with 15 big ones. Mm -hmm. That This set has really convinced me otherwise because the demo on here is great. And this live recording is fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. I, cause it has like that raspy Brian voice, you know, right around the, you know, what was it from 75, 76, 76, according to, yeah. Um, so yeah. that's raspy Brian voice. I like I like raspy Brian voice. Uh, it's a cool live version. You know, it's not, it's nothing that's, I'm going to like, didn't change my life or anything, but it's a cool live cut, you know? Yeah. Um, I, so I'm of the same mind, like 15 big ones might be one of if not my least favorite beach boys albums yeah my least favorite beach boys albums and the second one is going to ruffle some feathers because the second one is very much either you love it or you hate it it's miu is my other one that's fair that's a I, fair one <laughs> miu is my other like i don't understand miu i don't think people are gonna are there people that like that album i always assumed it was just kind of a universally like this sucks right <laughs> I thought so too, but you know, you go on to Smiley Smile and a lot of the fan boards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've always been perplexed, like beyond what I would like expect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's someone's well, favorite album. Well, it's like you, you go. So when Smiley Smile comes back online, <laughs> hopefully it comes back if online. It comes, back. it comes back online because there's a treasure trove of information on that board. Yeah. Um, but if it when it comes back online, go into the album review section of the of the site. It's not like frequently posted, yeah, yeah. In, but but like go onto the MIU, uh, the thread on there for MIU. It is shocking, and I, I can't. can't it's not just in that thread; it's elsewhere when it's mentioned on the board. It's a shocking the amount of people who like that album. And I'm like, what are you people talking <laughs> about? <laughs> this is so bland and just I not mean, not good. I love Match Point of Our Love is a great song. Match Point of Our Love is fantastic. Match Point of Our Love is so I will describe MIU. And yeah. Match Point, I think, is a great song. 
But what ruins it for me is its production and its arrangement. Because one of the things that bothers me, and we're getting off track again, but we'll get back on track in just a moment. This, the, a lot of the album, not all of the album, but a lot of it just sounds unfinished. It sounds like unfinished demos to me. And Al, like 21 years ago in an interview in Goldmine Magazine, actually just straight up said, yeah, it's, they, they're kind of un, like, they sound like that because they kind of all like that. So we just didn't finish the album. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on in that, at that point in Beach Boys history, it was a crazy time. They had two albums that either the Beach Boys themselves nixed, one of them was nixed by them, the other one was nixed by the label they were on. What was that? Like, um, that was either Warner or Caribou Records. I think it was Warner, actually. Was, it, yeah. was, was that, you're talking about the Christmas album? Yeah, the the, the oh. next one, yes. Hard. So they, they got two, so they, had, they did this in like a year from Love You, basically. 77 was Love You, 78 was MIU. Okay. Might have been a little bit longer than a year, a little bit less. It doesn't matter really because the point is the same. They had a very little time to work on this and they were down to Beach Boys. Like it was just Brian, Al, and Mike. And it's like for what they did, like in what they had to work with and the pressure and circumstances, actually, you know, I, I commend them because they did put out something that was, it's very impressive considering the circumstances. But it doesn't like I don't it's, no. At some point, you don't think to yourself, "We've got we've got this whole album right here. We could just put out Adult Child, and someone will listen to it." Like why why put yourself through that? I don't know. But back to back so, to back. yeah, we're way off topic. Like Fifteen big ones, and um, and MIU are my least favorite. So, but I unlike you, I've always liked Back Home. I did not ever like really hearing Brian's vocal for that song for the 70, what was that, 76 recording? Yeah. 76, it came out, 15 big ones. I don't like that. It works well on some songs and it works okay on a lot of other songs. On that song, it doesn't work well. And for me, I've always been like, no, I like this song, but I don't like this song. But I don't like this song because I don't like the vocal. And when you replace that, I like the song. It's, it's that that's kind of logic i work you've on. heard the 63 demo of it right i've heard that i've pretty much heard all versions now including the yeah. version on this box set that's the studio 71 yeah. which is an alternate version of the 70 version that was on uh, made in california which is probably still my favorite version of the song to be honest i do love the demo of course the original but i like what they did with it yeah so yeah. It, to me it, it just the fact that it's more complete and the fact that they, they did something different and it worked well, I like that. Great our vocal, great energy, great production. Um, but yeah, I can totally understand somebody not digging back home in the 76 version of it. But you didn't like the live version of it either, I take it? Or you no, I, I thought it was a solid version. I just, uh, it wasn't anything like, to me, the live version of take a load off your feet or the live version of this whole world. I'm like, these are like, yes. Great. You know what I mean? That one. I'm like, Oh, it's cool. I listened to it twice. And I kind of just like, I was yep. like, all right, I want to listen to sweet and bitter again or something, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, ditto pretty much <laughs> like this is, this is good. I like yeah, this cool. moving on, moving on. There's better stuff here, but it's cool. It's, it's a good, a good performance for sure. Okay. It's about time from the Fillmore East June 27th, 1971, the last concerts or the basically the farewell concert for the Fillmore East. Um, I love this. Oh, At first I listened to this and I was like, did they take the Central Park recording for this? And then I realized, wait a minute, no, it's not the Central Park recording. It's its own thing, but it's from the same tour. So that's why it sounds so similar yeah. in most respects, but obviously like you, the details there are missing there's some certain details from that central park performance that uh are missing here yeah. they'll just jump out at you like bruce i think introducing the song a little bit differently and other things it makes you wonder if they have this whole show why haven't they put it out <laughs> i want to hear this whole show if it's from 71 yeah it's a good point i mean i would think that for a show like that that they would have had like the soundboard recordings actually like yeah happening you know because 
the frustrating thing sometimes, it's not even that's frustrating. It's just a choice that they made. Um, <laughs> but they, they didn't always record their shows and save the soundboard recordings. They would like write over them. They would save it. And for a time, I know like in the late 60s, and this may have continued into the early 70s, but basically they used those recordings to improve as a live band. They would study them and say, okay, this needs to fix it. We need to do this differently sometimes. Like, let's experiment with this, et cetera, et cetera. But they would wipe over the tapes basically. Yeah. So, you know, the amount of stuff that can be released that would be suitable for a set like this is more limited Sure. And yeah. some other bands like the Grateful Dead, where like they recorded everything. It's like they, it's frustrating, but it's also like I understand that it's like they weren't thinking about some archival box set that was coming out 50 years from it. They were just like, how yeah. can we improve our live show? You know what I mean? Realistically, very few bands I imagine were yeah. <laughs> that era were thinking 50 years down the line, boy, we can make money off of this. It's <laughs> like that's the furthest thing from their mind, probably. What I want to know <laughs> is where is that Grateful Dead? Beach Boys recording. Why is that not on here? Well, that's so. I don't know. Did you did you check out? Did you ever see? Like, I was on Beach Boys Talk as a guest back in April, and no, I don't think I saw. I, I told my story. You've heard this. I've told this to you before. But how um, I became a fan, and it was really through my father and his yeah 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 for his story. But like that night, it was April twenty seventh, nineteen seventy one. Uh, that was the famous concert at the Fillmore East that we're talking about in this instance. There were two. It was that concert, April 27th, and then there was this concert, the farewell concert to the um, Fillmore East on June 27th. So, you know, a couple, you know, few months later, basically. But um, yeah, that was the, the, the concert that got my father back into the Beach Boys after a hiatus from them, after they kind of fell off the face of the planet in the yeah. U.S. at least. So like that, like he was physically there. And so I, the, the bootlegs, they're out there. Like that whole show, show the, that whole show is out there. And because the Grateful Dead, record, I imagine it's because the Grateful Dead recorded everything and they were just like using the Grateful Dead. So that exists. As to why it hasn't been officially released, I don't know. Probably should. Um, maybe it, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that the Grateful Dead, when they released their ver like their parts of that show, which is most of the show, mind you, they omitted the Beach Boys parts hmm. for legal reasons, most likely. Um, so the Beach Boys could still potentially release that. A couple of is like, and there might be some recording that has been released in the past that I'm completely forgetting about. But have they ever released officially any of the the tracks in that know. particular concert? No, and I think. Mark and Alan definitely like they're fans like us. They absolutely, they must have asked. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a reason why it's not on the box, but like oh, that would have been cool. It would have been cool. Agreed. But I love, I love any live performance of It's About Time. It is such an underrated track. It's one of my favorite on, favorites on Sunflower overall. My favorites are, you know, so, songs on Sunflower overall are probably This Whole World. Um, all I want to do, our sweet love, and it's about time. And I'm like, this song needs more love. It needs more respect. It needs more exposure. It's one of the coolest rockers that Dennis ever wrote, wrote the band ever wrote, for that matter. Um, I adore this song, and I adore any live performance of it. So this got you know two thumbs up for for me. When I saw uh, when I saw Mike and Bruce a couple weeks ago, they did that. Yeah, and it's I, really cool. I have, I've been hearing and kind of seeing a few things here and there about their performances of that. It's awesome that they're doing that. Doing a couple of other songs I know from this box set, although interestingly, not Disney Girls, which makes I don't know why. I, I was why. shocked. I was shocked that that's like Bruce's song. Like that's the song he does. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's maybe because he's a little older, maybe can't hit him the notes and everything. But I was, I was the whole show. I'm like, all right, they got to do Disney Girls, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. It's like, that's oh very strange. <laughs> it's like, of all the songs for a Sunflower and Surf's Up tour, what <laughs> song are we not going to play? Or, I mean, I've... I would love, to, I would have loved to have hear, heard Bruce do Tears in the Morning. Like, just pull something out of there. I, I, 
fully encourage Bruce to just play beach, obscure Beach Boy songs. If he wants to do She Believes in Love again, please. Yeah. Do well, it. you have, I mean, Bruce is there. To me, he's like, there. He's no, there. that's it's it. Not, he's there. No, but it's not that he's there. It's like he deserves a spotlight moment like that. Oh, Whether it be Disney Girls or one of his other songs, like She Believes in Love Again or Deirdre or whatever, he should get like one song at least. They, when I saw him, he sang, he sang, Do You Want to Dance? Which I was surprised. And then he did, um, You're So Good to Me. Which yeah, I, I was not I, expecting. Yeah. But I also think like, okay, he can, I mean, leads are one thing. I also just think that he deserves a chance to showcase yeah. his songs within the Beach Boys discography. Totally agree. And that's, you know, it's great to hear his, his leads, but I'm like, eh. I, wanna, I want an original. I want an original from him. I know like, okay, people don't go to Beach Boys concerts specifically for like one song and, or if it's not, if no, they do go for one song sometimes, I should say, but like they don't go for like, you know what I mean? I just having trouble like knowing how to. Yeah, I get what you're saying. They're, they're not there to hear those kinds of songs, but at the same time, <laughs> he still deserves it though. Sprinkle that in, yes. The two hour show, they yeah, can exactly. give, throw him a bone. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. but I also. I will say, and I think I had told you this, the main reason why I went to that last show with Mike and Bruce was because Mike was singing All I Want to Do, and I'm like, I want to hear that. Yeah. Like That was amazing, you know? We're going to talk a lot about a particular version of All I Want to Do a little bit All later. Right. All right. Because um, I want to talk about that with you. That is, oh, I'll save that for then. <laughs> Just, yes. Um, and then Riot in cell, cell Block number nine which was from the Big Sur Festival in 1970. To be honest, you know, I, listen, this song is on here because it's connected, of course, to um, student demonstration time from Surf's Up, which actually you could argue that this belongs in the Surf's Up bonus, but really it belongs in Sunflower because <laughs> it's of that era. But yeah, like, I like that song. I don't mind it. I actually think it's a cool rocker. And I don't know, I actually thought that performance was pretty cool. What did you think? Oh, I want to agree with you that it's student demonstration time and then also this particular recording of it. They're great. It's a great song. I think the problem most people have with it is it doesn't fit. It's yeah. out of place. I can I can even live with it being out of place, honestly. I just don't I hate the lyrics because they're like it's an anti-protest protest song. Like <laughs> What yep. kind of shit it is that? Sense. Come on, Mike. Like, well, in Mike's autobiography, he basically said, "Well, it's just a plea to to get like remind kids to stay safe and have them stay safe." And I'm like, it's like Jack um, Riley's got this whole thing going. They're doing this ego friendly, you know, meditation. They're they're being all cool, and then right smack in the middle of it, Mike's going, "Don't go to protests." It's like, do you know your audience? Like, come on, man. Yeah, and I agree. I'm not a fan of, of the the lyrics on student demonstration time. I think they they make the song worse. But the song itself musically rips. It's it's great. It's killer, yeah, it's, from, it's basically cell block number nine, pretty much. It's yeah, cool. which like I'm glad it, they put that in there. Basically, it's it's Chuck Berry, but with you know new lyrics. Chuck Berry, <laughs> Berry melody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It, it's the same kind of thing, basically. So surfing USA all over again. Yeah, pretty much, except like the inverse when it comes to success yeah. and recognition. Um, sorry, Mike, we, we love you, but you know, it's just our opinions, it's whatever. It's, um, okay, then we get to the bonus tracks for the Sunflower Disc, starting with the original single mix of Breakaway. Did you notice anything with this? I mean, nope. I I, I, it's cool to hear the original right song, but I'm like, man, eh, it's not that different. I really can't. Yeah, I, didn't, I really didn't notice it. I, I didn't notice it either. The main version of that song I know mix wise is the one that's off. Um, what's the comp from the 70s? The one, What's the comp that comes after Endless? What? So it's not the one that's like the follow up to uh, Endless Harmony. 
Uh, Endless Summer, you mean? Endless Summer. Um, Spirit of America? Spirit of America, or something. It's some, America's in the title. I yeah, see this cover. Of, you know, America. That's the mix I know. And a pe- the third sequel. But that's, you know, you said, yeah. That's the mix I know. And I had looked it up, and apparently that's the single mix. But I don't know the difference, because it wasn't on an album. So as far as I know, there only is a single mix. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like, usually it's like, okay, the single mix is different, or maybe it's shorter than the album version or what, you know. I don't know what the difference is. I didn't notice a difference. However, it is a great song, and it is a gem in the Beach Boys catalog. Agreed. Celebrate the news. Uh, I've never... That's one of those tracks I've always just kind of been like, whatever. Yeah. It's, a, it's, 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 it's underwhelming. I like... Is that that's the one with the end tag, right? With uh, it's, uh, it's it's a Brian esque end tag, but it's a Den- it's got it, yeah, because it's a Dennis Wilson song. It's got to be this one. It's a bonus track on the twenty twenty CD releases. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed. It's like <laughs> it's one of these songs I just don't gravitate to. Yeah, it's not a bad song, but it's on. I'm like, all right, cool. Yep. It's just like I don't know. Like I love. I actually am a big fan of 2020, the album, which is like a very unpopular opinion for a lot of people. I like the diversity. I like the variety. I think the songs are very strong. It's not cohesive stylistically, but like to me, the overall sound is more important. Not so much the style, and it is somewhat consistent in terms of how it sounds. It doesn't sound like this was from one album. That one's from another album in terms of like how they're mixed and what the overall sound is but stylistically everything's very different on an album like you can tell like there's just no synergy between the styles and that's what bothers a lot of people but when i get through that album in the past you know i've listened to it on cd and i basically get to that track and old folks at home and those kind of kinds of tracks i shut it off sometimes i won't shut other albums off with the uh bonus stuff because i like hearing that stuff um i shut this off pretty much in 2020 i don't know why it's not like this is a bad song but i don't know i just it never did anything for me i just maybe you're just worn out by the time it gets there probably <laughs> probably you might be right because it's just jumping all over because is it cabin essence and then straight to celebrate the news yes that might be too much uh, that's too much yeah. You, you're probably right. I've never really thought about it, but yes, you, you sing in that, that allowed. Yeah. That's probably the reason. Yeah. Um, okay. The original mix of loop de loop. I have a love hate relationship with loop de loop. Mm-hmm. It's a song that always gets stuck in my head and I can never get it out. And I think I find it interesting because that's almost like Al's smile in a way is really, he never actually finished it. And there's all these different like versions and like, I don't know. I find it very interesting. Um, I don't, nothing really jumps out of me specifically about this particular mix, to be honest with you. Um, Hearing the, hearing the, yeah, the, the falsetto vocal. Mm-hmm. is interesting i i understand now hearing this why al wanted to re-record his vocals in the uh what is it and the, in the uh, 90s. endless harmony yes for that was endless harmony see i got him mixed up but yeah 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 i get it um it's cool it like you said it's just another version of a song we know um but it's not bad i'm glad it's on here you know it's good it's a good song i like this mix i don't know if i like it more or or I don't really know if I like it more or less than the, the 98 mix. Yeah, I, you can just I, like I, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get why, I also get why Al, like, re-recorded it, but, like, I don't know, I actually find this fine. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, it's any better or worse, per se, although I understand why Al did what he did with re-recording his part. Yeah. Um. Okay. San Miguel. <laughs> this song, I love this song. I think most people love this song. Most people are like, why the heck did, 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 was this not released? Yeah. Time period, like, what the heck? 
I mean, I this box set really that was another song I think I appreciated more because that's on what 10 years of harmonies, the first time that ever makes an appearance on like an official release. Uh, I don't recall actually where it first made an official release. I think so. I'll have to double check. I'm pretty sure that's what it is though. Yeah, but the fact that they just didn't put that out is it's so good, and I. Definitely have a new appreciation for it, hearing it in the context of like the time period. You know what I mean? Because it's, I swear to God, it's on a comp. Like that's the oh, first yeah. time it was oh, ever I, put out. It definitely is. I just don't know which one. Yeah, You're but fine. it's like, you know what I mean? When you hear a comp and it's like, there's a new song in there. You're like, all right, whatever. I just want to listen to the songs I know. Like you, you listen to a compilation to hear the song you want to hear. Mm -hmm. To me, hearing it with the context of like, this is when it was recorded. This is what was going on in the time period. Like it's much more interesting. And I feel like I have more of an appreciation for it now, mm -hmm. having heard it in the context of this, which is why I like box sets like this so much is because you kind of get to put everything together. 100% agreed. I want to take this opportunity to comment on and commend the amazing sound quality of a lot of this stuff. Because you hear San Miguel, you hear this coming out of speakers, like good quality speakers. Oh my God. It's yeah. like, this is amazing. So tons of props to Mark Lynette. It's like, yeah, those Shout background vocals, those background harmonies just jumping out at you like that. Oh, I mean, I don't know what else to say. It's just, it's right. it's it's just fantastic. Fact, it should have been released. I actually think it would have fit on like uh, Surf's Up because there's a, you know, I, it's about a place basically. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's stylistically, it, it kind of is its own thing, but. Anyway. Yeah, I don't think Jack, Jack Riley would have let them put that on there. <laughs> yeah, I, but I wish it was. I mean, honestly, it fits more on Sunflower. It's just like, so. even if they dropped it as a single, like just to have it out there, you know? It's a great song, but. This is the Beach Boys, my friend. They have- I know, if it's a good decision, they won't make it. Locked in the vault <laughs> for half a century. It's like, what yeah. are you doing? What? what? Why is locked away? What are you What are you doing? It's driving crazy. It, it is. The Beach Boys, you know, in my opinion, I know this is your opinion, they're the most amazing band in the world, but they're also the most frustrating band. Oh my gosh. Oh, I mean, the fact that we almost didn't get this box set is oh, insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? That we, like, oh, it's crazy. It's just insane. But, uh, Cincinnati. Is this the, oh, this is the, this is the one from, that ends up on 15 big ones, right? So, yes and no. So, this is the same, I think, recording overall, but it's been mixed Different. differently. So, I want to comment here by just saying real quick, and this is the primary difference that I noticed with this. And this is actually, to my ears, this sounds pretty much the same mm -hmm. as the mix that was, was released on uh, Made in California in 2013. So I don't know if they did anything to this, to be honest, even though they're calling this a 2020 mix. If they did, I can't tell the difference, but um, there is this really weird and distracting vocal effect on al's voice in the 15 big one of yep but it's like obnoxious in terms of how upfront it is it's like it's not even a reverb it's like slathered in it um yeah. and i have always disliked but i don't like the i don't like the effect in general although there are exceptions to that because i think the effect itself has been used elsewhere on things i do like including i think on surfs up quite a bit too but here, well, not here, but on 15 big ones, like it stands out in not a good way. It's almost like I kind of get a little nauseous hearing it if I listen to it too much. And it's just grating. And this version and the 2013 Made in California version gets rid of that echo effect on Al's voice. And I'm like, yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, I despise that effect. But it sounds so much better without it. And I actually enjoy the song. Is it one of my favorite songs? Not really, but I enjoy it. And this is yeah. by far my favorite mix of it. It's a fun. Hey, also, I would agree with that. Also, my friend who I mentioned, my very good friend, his name is Joe. He brought this up to me 
that, you know, how I said, you know, earlier, uh, he loved the live version of Susie Cincinnati. One of the things he was asking me at one point was, uh, well, what's the story behind this song? How did Al think of this? Or how did, what's the, like, who is Susie Cincinnati? Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the inspiration? You know, it's like, and, you know, I was like, I have no idea, actually. You would think that, you would think that I would know. You that. out of all people would know. Because I'm like, you know, he, it's like, you know, I go, he goes to me and a lot of people go to me whenever they have a Beach Boys related question. It's just like, when you become the biggest Beach Boys fan in your group, people come to you. I know yeah. it's got, it's true of you too, but like, it's true of me as well. And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm like, hopefully the box set gives us some answers to that. Cause I'm actually very curious about that. Like, what was the inspiration? I don't know. Yeah. Sadly, the, the box did not deliver on that, but Oh, well, well if, if either of us ever meets Al again, because we're we're seeing him in Portchester together. Oh, you got tickets? Of course I did. I got I got tickets as soon as you're they were on twice. Set. You're saying I'm seeing I'm seeing Brian Allen Blondie. The the venue they're playing on Long Island yep. is right across the street from where I used to work. And I thought I was gonna be working there in October. So I was like, oh, I'll just go after work. And now I have to drive and out, whatever. But I'm going there, and then the next day they're going to play playing in Portchester, and I'll be there too. Awesome! I have VIP tickets with my friend Joe, so we'll be nice. there early. Are they doing meet and greets for the VIP? I don't know, and they—I don't think they are, and that's yeah. unfortunate. I like that's the real appeal, but of course, course. of course, is putting a, as an understandable wrench in that. And part yeah. of my fear is that for the immediate future. And by immediate, I mean like the next couple of years, maybe. <laughs> I'm not yeah. even sure that like they'll reinstate meet and greets. I don't know. I, I worry that they're a thing of the past until yeah. COVID really gets under control and settles down, which it's not fully under control now as of the time that we're recording this. Um, I hope that there's a way that maybe they can make it happen with like a lot of precautions, a lot of requirements and if yeah. like a person wants to meet those requirements and can show and prove it, um, then the meeting and greet can still happen, but like still with like social distancing. It's like no, yeah, no, just standing behind them and taking a picture, like standing like six feet behind them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And taking off your mask only to smile and not breathing and then putting it back on. I'm like, I do that. <laughs> so I the answer they're is doing that at New York Comic Con. They're having like I, I was I saw an advertisement for it. They're having like a, a divider between you and the person, and you just stand on the divider. And I'm like, that's got. Oh be yeah, crazy. just okay. I didn't even know like, those existed. So, oh, fingers crossed. But I don't know. I, I doubt it will happen. Yeah. Um, but we can always just. It's very e the door outside the cap is like right by the train station where they oh, yeah. have to walk in. You can just hang out over there. That's what I'm gonna do. Nice. I want to talk to honestly. I want to talk to Blondie. I just want to be like. What's up, man? You know, <laughs> just want to hang out with Blondie. That is admirable and also probably quite the trip. We'll see. We'll see what happens, man. Alrighty, getting back to this. Uh, good time, 2019 mix. I listened to this. Other than the amazing sound quality, which is like very much improved and noticeable, there's no like actual difference with the track except. I think they removed the fade at the end, hence why there's an extra, what, like four-ish seconds or something like that at the end. Yeah. But they didn't really do much else other than like make it sound amazing sound quality wise, but um, it's pretty much the same. What do you think? I think it's so interesting that for, for some reason in 77, they go back to this song. And then in 80, they go back to when girls get together. And yet, they they have no interest in in revisiting, you know, like all of my love or any of those type. You know, like why were why were those the songs that were picked to revisit? You know, like I just don't. Or even like Big Sur is is redone again for for Holland. You know, why those songs were picked and others were just kind of discarded. The questions of life and being a beast. <laughs> True. It's like why. Why do we have all this amazing stuff in our vault that we're not doing anything that with? That we're not doing anything with, yeah. Yeah, mysteries. Mysteries of life as a Beach Boys fan. 
Um, but there's really not too much to say, I feel, about this one. No. I mean, I've always liked the track. I actually like it on Love You, despite the fact that, like, Brian's voice. Oh, it's uh, back to, like, 60s, early 70s, Brian. But wait, how is that possible? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, like, it is. did they know, like, was that heavily advertised that, oh, this is a track from, like, seven years ago? I doubt it. I doubt yeah. it, too, but I'm like. I, I remember the first time I heard that album, though, that was super jarring. I was like, what happened to, like, Raspy? Love is a woman. What happened to that, Brian? You know, it's very weird. Me too. I mean, yeah, it was jarring, but I'm like, actually, the more I listened to it in the context of that, that uh, the context of that album, I, the more I liked it because it's like a throwback yeah. to when Brian was like that and what you expect Brian to be like, a little bit more traditional orchestration, Brian wise. Um, I feel it it helps love you overall, despite the fact that it kind of comes out of nowhere. That album is comes out of nowhere the album i think right but, yeah well i would i would have been curious and i hope they do something i don't know i don't know in terms of rights if they're able to i would love for them to do something with the american spring recordings because they did a version of good time mm -hmm. i think that was on yeah that must have been 72 so it predates the official release of the beach boys one mm -hmm. um so I would have been curious to have had, you know, had that on the box set or something, you know, but I yeah. guess that would fit more into the next one we're getting. Potentially. If, if yep. we can even have it, you know, I want to, I want to hear the instrumental and acapella versions of Sweet Mountain so badly. Oh yeah. That song, <laughs> oh, so good. Anyway, we're, we're a little off topic. Games 2 can play. It's a cute song. About all I can say about it. It's cute. Ditto. I heard this on the Sirius XM station um, over the summer. I'm like, wow, of all the songs I've all right, yeah. expected to hear on any kind of radio. Um, going going back to Match Point of Our Love, that was one of the first songs they played. They did, you know, Serving USA, Fun, Fun, Fun. They did some hits and then they threw that one out there. And I was like, whoa, weird to hear this on the radio, you know? Yeah. It's so. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about the Sirius uh, XM radio station, but it was so, it, after a while, it gets really jarring to listen to because you have all these styles from all these eras. It's, it's, like, it's a, a, lot, well, yeah. a lot. A well, a lot of time. And like, I could only, and this is true of even when it was back uh, in 2018, when it was live, um, that was true even then. I'm like, I need to pay, this is like a dream come true. But I found that I need to pace myself and like, okay, I'm cutting myself off. This is enough because everything is just so jarring. And sometimes anyway, I love no, this, all this, but when you mix it up like this, just randomly, it's like- Throws you off. It really it throws, throws you it, off. Like, there's so many emotions. It's yeah. like you're, you're on an emotional roller coaster going up and down. It's like, what? Um, but yeah, no, it's a cute song. Not one of my favorites, never has really been but I don't dislike it and I'm glad it's on the box because it is from this era and it's good sounding. Like, yeah, again, sound across the board is amazing. Um, okay, 2021 mix, stereo mix of uh, Cotton Fields. I think what they did with this one, I, is this the only version of Cotton Fields like studio-wise on this set? Because if it is, it has to be. They added, There's an acapella version, I think, later on, too. Okay, and then it, it's one of these two. Um, memories, I can't remember which one, but uh, they have a little voice at the beginning, like a studio kind of intro. That's Matt Jardine as a little kid. I was gonna. I was actually going to ask you if that was him, because it was like, it's a little kid counting, right? Yep. Yeah, that's cute. I'm glad it all comes full circle. Well, and another thing, it's very much... It's it's a precursor, really, even though we didn't really hear this until kind of now, like this year, meaning. But it's kind of a precursor, chronologically speaking, to um, Carl and what he did with the traitor on oh, yeah. Holland, where that's uh, that's hi. Wilson, that's Jonah Wilson. <laughs> and I I believe. Yeah, that's so, awesome. I didn't know that. But yeah, it's a cute moment and like yeah, yeah. It's i think there's you could probably 
write a book on all the different mixes and versions of cotton fields because there's the one on 2020 there's the single version there's the one it's the one that al did then there's the one brian did there's a lot of them you know yep but al likes to tinker with stuff so that stands to reason i can't help him well now there's like a thousand different versions of waves of love so. <laughs> it's like oh i, I think there's apparently are... another one coming out too like all right like Okay, Al. I if you're if by some chance you are watching this, Al, I love you. I'm like a huge fan of you, and I like that song. But but maybe it's time to to experiment with a few other things. Just not that you don't have to like not that you have to stop with Waves of Love. But let's let's no no stop, Al. I'm telling you to stop. Okay. Well, Al, you should five victims is a lot, want, Al. Al should be able to do what he wants, but he should consider <laughs> consider that. <laughs> he should consider maybe not mixing Waves of Love again. Yeah, it's like what six or seven, eight. There's or, a lot. Of them. There's a lot of them. Bear in they mind, they got it right. the The first the first one is solid. The second one, like the East Coast one, that's my favorite. And then I'm like, I don't need any more. Yeah, I think actually Al got it right. I forget what they call this version, but it's the one. With the, I think it's the saxophone intro. Yeah, that's the that's the one I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that my one, favorite. That's one. my favorite version as well. I think you got it right that time. Carl's still in it. He's kind of mixed in a way where like the the vocals just blend more with his. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, his vocals blend more with the backing track. I feel like that was like my favorite version. I have loved the other versions too, but they're interesting. But it's like I'm not getting anything new out of this, right? But you know, Al, you 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 have deserved to you you've you deserve to do whatever you want. So don't don't listen to us. But like as listeners, it would be nice for some diversity. <laughs> it's like we want to hear new stuff. Remix me. another song, even like if you're gonna remix I, something. Jenny Clover was really good. I like Jenny. Clover. Yeah, man, it's a good song. I'm glad he. I want I want another Jardine solo album. Me too. Me too. Um. But that concludes disc number one. And then disc That was disc one? <laughs> yes. We have four more. <laughs> oh, man. That's so funny. Surf's Up. They call this the 2019 Master. I cannot tell the difference from the 2009 Master at all. No. Sorry, I can't. It's just the honest truth. I, I hear no difference. I, I'm not saying there is no difference. I just cannot hear a difference. There's a difference. It's very subtle, um, but it's it's good. That's all I got to say. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Surf's Up album, so you don't need to do much to it to like improve my opinion of it. Um, so, but also at the end, they also have the Surf's Up promo. So here, when they get to this uh, section, this not, not section, this track, this bonus track, you kind of hear like they're really pushing advertising wise the fact that they have grown up and have left the waves of and the sand yeah. of the beach for dry land and yeah i mean when when you say that outright in like a commercial like that a commercial spot for radio which is really what this is um like it doesn't get any more obvious and clear than that Seems a little desperate. It does. Give us a chance, come on. At the same time, though, this was a desperate time for them in terms of like, yeah. we're making this amazing stuff. Please listen to us. Yeah. Like, mm, like I can understand. I'm not gonna like harp on that. I'm not gonna hold that against them. I mean, they kind of were desperate in certain ways by this point in time when it came to the live shows and their new music. It's all amazing, yeah. but. You know, a lot of time, unfortunately, it takes people a while to catch on to this stuff. It took people a while to catch on to pet sounds in this uh, in this country, UK and elsewhere, not so much. They loved it from the beginning and rightfully so. But here, it took a little bit to catch on. Um, and I feel like a similar kind of thing is slowly but surely happening to this era. But good Lord, like back then, this, this is rough. It, like if you've, 
read or anecdotes or and you know watch documentaries in the band it's rough it, I, I have no other word to describe it so they sound desperate in a way because they kind of are they shouldn't be but but they, but they are from a please buy this and allow us to perform it which they would do anyway but like still but I liked this promo. Um, I like all the promos. Like, what is there not to like? Oh, about? Yeah, yeah. Okay, bonus track. Surf's Up Live. Oh, my gosh. We're starting off with one of the – it's the same rarity show from 93. Take a load off your feet, as you mentioned earlier. I love this live version. It's really yeah, it's fun. so cool. Uh, I, Al actually said that he likes this version. He, says, he said in an interview – he never really liked that song, despite the fact that he wrote and sang it. But he's never <laughs> really read, he's never really liked it, and he started to like it a lot more recently because he got a chance to hear this performance. That's awesome! Yeah, yeah. it's a great, it's a fantastic recording. Mm -hmm. Again, would love to hear that show. Oh yeah, ditto. Which actually, I pulled up the set list. I forgot to look at it though. So while we're on the subject. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. Okay, you want to hear something weird? They do. <laughs> this is very strange. They do under the boardwalk, little deuce coop, yada yada yada. Summer in paradise, heroes and villains. Whoa! Imagine hearing summer in paradise and then hearing <laughs> heroes and villains, and then vegetables, then take a load off your feet, and then little Saint Nick. What a uh, you know, you're talking about the radio station and listening to all these weird periods. That's got to be it. so jarring. I wonder how audiences. Re well, I mean, I'm sure there's anecdotes out there. I think I've read a couple, but I really like would have loved to see how yeah. audiences reacted to that. Oh, they did. They did all this is that at that show as well. So we'll probably get that one on the next uh, next box. Yep, that'd be cool. But. In short, we both love this performance. It's awesome. Sure. Long Promise Road, live 1972. I don't remember much about this performance. Like, I'm trying to think, like, what did this sound like to me? And I, it sounds pretty accurate to the record, I think, honestly. Because okay. I just love the, the song. Like, it's literally, I would say it's my second favorite on Surf's Up. It's also my favorite Carl song, despite the fact that I know his feel flows for him. I actually like Long Promise Road better. I like both, but I like it uh, Long Promise Road better. I don't know why. This should jump out at me a lot more, but um, I just this doesn't. I don't know why. I don't remember. I, I don't remember like disliking it. I just can't remember like what. Well, we're I on the same page about it because I don't remember it super well either. Yeah, definitely. just kind of it's there. Disney Girls from 1982. I was going to bring this up. I think they missed an opportunity with Disney Girls. Because we were talking about that's Bruce's signature song. Mm -hmm. I would have been so curious to hear like mid, early to mid 2000s, like Mike and Bruce tour era live recording. Because I know they exist of Bruce singing Disney Girls, like, an, like 2002 or something, Bruce singing Disney Girls. 82, I feel like it's a fine recording. I don't think it's bad or anything. Um, I just think if you're going to throw a, I don't know. Apparently, they listen to it because this is a song that's been done live mm -hmm. so many times. Yep. Like, I'm sure they listen to a bunch of them and we're like, this is the best one. But like, for my money, that is that is a live period that has never been explored ever. Like, post Carl's death, you know, pre C50 reunion just bruce and mike touring together like it's never been on any archival stuff you know yeah and it's kind of ironic and amusing in a certain way because all the other live iterations of the beach boys have live albums it was al with the uh live in las vegas cd brian did live at the roxy and the, now love another love one love brian wilson and friends um mike and bruce haven't Kind and they did one for the reunion tour too. Yeah, that too, that lineup. But it's kind of odd. Maybe 
I don't know, is it could maybe it's related to the marketing and like the usage of I just game. don't think they care to do it. Like they'd rather just probably they don't see a reason to do it, but I suppose. But I they would you would imagine they had recorded some of those shows. It's oh, yeah. easier, it's it's so cheap and easy to just record a live show now from a soundboard. It it costs essentially nothing to do. So you really have no reason to not do it. You know. Yeah, I agree. I think more stuff should be released. Honestly, from all eras, to be honest, but definitely the less explored ones too, um, and that's definitely the less explored one. Okay, I have a, a little bit of something to say about this one because I do remember this because it's my favorite song, "Surfs Up Live" nineteen seventy three mm. from Chicago. Um, this is not a bad performance by any means. It's a good performance. I've heard a lot better though from from the band in that era. The problem is none of the ones that I've heard that I would describe as better exist in studio recording quality where it would be possible to really put it on this box set. There are some good quality recordings out there, but not good enough for a box set like this. Hmm. So I was a little on, uh, I mean, I'm gonna, you know, I was a little torn about this. Um, yeah, because there there were better performances of it in my opinion back then. Um, just off at the top of my head, there's a bootleg out there from a live concert at Princeton in New Jersey, Princeton University. Um, there's this amazing, and it's on YouTube too. You can look this up, but amazing performance of Surfs Up live. Um, that might be like my favorite live recording of Surfs Up ever, except for maybe the Brian Wilson Presents Smile version. Um, like the live DVD. I also love that, of course, but like for vintage Beach Boys, this might be like my favorite live recording of hmm. possibly ever, that one from 1971. I've also heard other ones. You know, there's one from Tampa from like, I think 74. There's one, um, I don't know, I, this has been driving me crazy. I'm trying to find out anybody who's watching this after the fact or during this, whatever the case may be, anybody knows this, please like, drop a comment and let me know. But uh, on the Sale On podcast, back when they were covering the Smile Sessions, they had an episode where they were talking about a bunch of the, the, uh, the songs that they were working on at, at a specific point in the Smile Sessions. And this was really like their Surf's Up heavy ep uh, episode where they were talking about Surf's Up a lot. And they played towards the end of that episode a live version, version, <clears throat> excuse me, of Surf's Up, Carl singing it, of course, clearly from the early 70s. And I'm like, I cannot stop listening to this. I would play that part over and over again. I'm like, where is this from? I would love to know that. Somebody must, like, where? I, I want to I have this. But this version, that's a good version. But I... I, there are definitely better ones. I feel. I feel like you know from that era. It's just unfortunate that we couldn't have those other ones as options. But for what it is, it's good. Yes, yeah, still. You yeah. What's in this one? I just think it's kind of insane that Carl would go out every night and like hit that super super high note, mm -hmm. like perfectly, and just be like, eh, you know, whatever. It's insane. Yeah. That really, that's really all I got. I just remember listening to that and be like. He just, no problem at all, just hit that note. Yeah, it's incredible. Why he's the best, yeah. He is the best. <laughs> it's like, after a while, I'm like, that's just the way it is. <laughs> that's, yeah, man. <laughs> incredible, you never, like, you never truly, like, you know, what's the word? You never truly, like, believe that it's just ordinary, because you can't believe it's just organ ordinary. Like, yeah. who is this ordinary for? But it is for these guys. For him, Carl, yeah. for Brian back in the 60s. It's just, I, I don't know. Like, who, like, how is that possible? I don't know. But <laughs> I, I know that feeling. So, uh, student demonstration time live 1971 from Carnegie Hall. Actually, wait a minute. This is confusing. They say on uh, the list I'm looking at, it's live 1971. The recording date and venue they're saying is November 23rd, 1972. This might be 
because Mark Lynette did go on to smiley smile afterwards and correct himself one time. This might be the one of the ones or the one. I, I don't know if they correct multiple things that he maybe corrected after the fact. But if he corrected it and it's and this is actually right, it's from 72. Well, it's listed as 71. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Thoughts on this? Don't really have any. I, like, I think we covered student demonstration time enough. Like Pretty much, yeah. good rocker kind of dumb lyrics yeah to hear it live you know you get that energy and i like hearing that for sure in a live setting on a studio um <laughs> i see why I Ryan cell block was such a big like live song, song for them when they did that live like i get yeah. that you know definitely and so now we're moving on to the bonus tracks towards the end of disc two big sir do we even need to talk oh. about big sir and how amazing it is it's weird. So we had talked briefly about like, it's weird hearing a lot of these songs in good quality after hearing them on bootlegs for so many years. Mm -hmm. Cause like I, this is a song pre this box set that I would listen to constantly and hearing it like in a, it's just weird to me. Like I, the other day I put on the lousy bootleg version of it. I have just because that's the one I know. And it like, that felt weird to listen to because I've listened to the one off the box set so much now, but God, it's so good. It's the version that ends up on Holland is solid. It fits in the medley that they have going for them. Mm -hmm. It's all good, but God, this version is great. It's so fantastic. I was very, when I first heard this, and they, this was the first song that they pretty much released as a promo single for the box set. When I first heard this, I was like, this is really nice and cool. I think I prefer the Holland version. And then the more I heard it, I'm like, wait a minute. No, that's not right. <laughs> I, this, yeah. This is better. Had you heard it prior to the box set? So I own, I did own a bootleg that had it. So yes, but if I, but I, I, even though I have it, I think I might've listened to it once. Okay. And then never listened to it again. So yeah, yes, but not really. It's like, it's not something I would ever like remember or stick out in my mind or things like that. Well, yeah, um, I concede to the majority in this case. I think this is the better version. Not that the Holland version is bad. Different vibe. It's honestly like a very sure. country-ish vibe. Do -do 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 -do. It's like the California girls kind of rhythm almost. Um, the Holland version. Well, it's definitely like a waltz feel too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, three, four time. Definitely. Um, but yeah, this is... You know, how would you describe this? Serene is one way I'd describe it. It reminds me a lot of All I Want to Do in the sense of it's just kind of like chill, kind of like lo-fi before low, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just cool, man. It's like, God, why didn't why didn't they put this out? You know, I mean, I'm glad we're listening to it now, but like yep. the fact that it has a million streams signifies that there's it's good and people know about it, which is also yep. very good. Agreed. It's it's kind of ridiculous to be honest. It's like wow, yeah. no that's so cool. This recording is like fifty years old. So like, yeah, and it feels like something that could have come out like last week. You know, yep. timeless. It's really, really cool. Help is on the way. I help is on the way is one of those songs. It's become kind of a joke, but it's like it's fun. It's a fun song. It's essentially an advertisement for Radiant Radish. Like it's that's one that telling the story of this period of the Beach Boys. You have to have it on the box set. It makes sense where it is in the box set. Uh, I'm it, it it's been released before. Wasn't it on the Good Vibrations box set was, from the 90s? Yeah, the 93 one. Yeah. So it's been released already, but it's a it's a great song. I Yeah. I feel like I feel like the fade out happens a little bit later. Like I can hear them messing around towards the end, which I think is cool. But yeah, definitely. It's a great song. This is a song, and this is in the, the Howie Edelson liner notes that he wrote. And we're yeah. gonna talk about that a little bit later. But um, 
Al made an anecdote in that in the liner notes specifically about how he would come to Brian's house before everybody else arrived and he and Brian would just like mess around on the piano. And so he would try to make things fun for Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this was, pro I, I don't remember if this is specifically said in the liner notes, but I'm pretty sure it's true. This is one of the songs where like the origin of it was that basically. They were yeah. just messing around the piano and coming up with lyrics and it was just for fun. So cool song. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say because did, I like it, but it's it's it is not one of my favorites. But it, do you know if they didn't put that out because Radiant Radish kind of went under, or if it was just? Question. I think so. It's either that or they never intended to release it at any point because it was just them pretty much doing their own thing and not expecting to put it on any kind of album. I swear to God, it was on Landlocked. The yeah, original. you might be right, actually. So I guess I got to take that back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that no, up. No, I'm pretty sure you're positive, actually, now that I, I think about this. But yeah, yeah I mean, Landlocked yeah. is kind of a myth. There was never a True. official Landlocked. That's the thing is I really wish that they had kind of even done that where there was a one LP option of this box set and it was like, here's Landlocked or here's the rock and roll re revival, whatever Bruce wanted to call the album, or you know what I mean? Fading rock and roll revival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is such a funny title. Like, they just did that recently with, um, uh, there was a David Bowie re-release where they was like, here's the original title, here's the original artwork that they had made up, and like, new track listing. And it's like, all right, if you're going to re-release something and keep it interesting, I don't know. It's too yeah. late now, but... Yeah, I, I, a bunch of people actually that I saw online actually suggested that they do this. They kind of do it, it like a fantasy, landlocked. Yeah, yeah. What could music, it be? fading rock, all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, that would be that would be cool, but no, they're not going to do that. I can't. I it's very unlikely. I'm like, and eh, nah. can I make a critique really quick of the vinyl box set specifically because that's the only physical version of this album I own. Mm -hmm. To me, the people that are going to buy the physical stuff are people who already own Sunflower and Surf's Up. Mm -hmm. And these these aren't new mixes. Why put Sunflower and so That's two whole LPs that you could be dedicating to other stuff that's not on the box set that's on the five CD one. And it drives me crazy. And worst of all, I don't know why they do this. There's like one or two extra bonus tracks at the end of each side of the album, which ruins the flow of the out, like just drove me crazy. I um, understand that for certain. It's frustrating. They have the reasons for what they do. Doesn't mean we think that they're- You have to agree with them. <laughs> that we, that we agree with them, exactly. Yeah. Um, I had to get that off my chest. Yeah, yeah, but it's very on topic, actually, that you mentioned that, just because if this were a vinyl-only release, I would be like, yeah, do that. Like, the whole yeah. Landlocked and the Fading Rock Group revival um, concept or the concepts of them, like, remaking kind of those LPs, yeah. if they could, for a vinyl release only. That would be cool. But this is not a vinyl release only, so I can understand why they didn't do that. But if they did, yeah, I would be like, that makes a lot of sense. They should do that. Go all in. But it is what it is, as they say. And as they say. Yep. Okay, sweet and bitter. Let's talk about this track because I freaking love it, and I know you do too. It's my favorite song on the box. It it's, is it's mine okay. too. I love <laughs> this song. Oh my God. Why, why was, I know we're like, we're, we're basically broken records ourselves right now. Why yeah. did they not release it? But we actually do know why they didn't release this. Okay. I mean, down to ban politics pretty much. Like the outside writer in this case, yes, it was a Brian Wilson song too, but it was Don Goldberg who wrote this. And around that time, like things were getting weird with like the Beach Boys in general and their interpersonal interactions towards the end of like the Surf's Up era and the beginning of 
the uh, Call on the Passions era, uh, or you know, time period where they were recording that. Um, so I kind of get that it's still not smart or worth defending, but well, I I read somewhere I understand that you know it's like okay, this is yeah. the same stuff that the Beach Boys have had issues with is that okay, they're a group, they're a family. Families fight sometimes. So, yeah. I had read somewhere that Mike had a cold or something when he sang it, which is another I cannot one. Tell. I couldn't tell. Yeah, I couldn't tell either. I don't know if that's true. Is, isn't that the same with Catch a Wave? He had a cold then, right? No, I didn't know that. Really? I feel, uh, I'm now second guessing myself a little bit here, but I'm pretty sure, yes, he had a cold. That's, that that's wild. You, you wouldn't, you could have fooled me, you know? Well, I mean, he fools everybody because I'm pretty sure like nobody notices that until he's like, until like they read about it or they hear about it. It's like, oh, Mike had a cold that day. Do you ever notice? And who the hell notices that? Like who, who is looking out for that? How would you notice yeah. that? Unless it's like really obvious. No. And this is vintage Mike. This is 1963 Mike Love extremely like his voice is at its peak strength wise yeah um but yeah this song god i love it it's so good the chord progression is great the melody just it, it's so appealing it's such an appealing song and the bass the fuzzy bass on it's great the or like everything about it just has such a groove to it it's such a great song man it's so so good and i'm glad i can like put it on spotify playlists now you know what i mean God, yes that, i was so excited because i've just got my i made a playlist of like work songs and i've always wanted to put i just got my pay on it but they took the good vibrations box off spotify for some stupid reason they took the pet so, sound set down too and then i'm like why the heck would you take why? it now it's it breaks my heart. I have the acapella pet sounds on like my Dropbox, so if I ever just want to listen to it, but like big yeah. mistake. Anyway, but I uh, it's an amazing song, and I'm so happy that more people know it now. You know. Yeah, me too. God, I mean, I want to say more. I don't know if I have anything really to actually say other than <laughs> what I've been saying. Just want to gush about it for a little I while. I just want to like. <laughs> pump it up and it's like oh this is my jam i'm so glad that this is out finally i'm like yeah i, I can't get over how good it is yeah um also another track that i am extremely pleased is out there now my solution good yes oh, yeah. of my solution it is such a an unusual song but not unusual in a bad way at all unusual in a good way it is such an earworm. You get those vocals stuck in your head and it goes from like creepy, unsettling to um, almost soothing in a certain way. It's a very weird combination of like emotions that go through you, but it's so satisfying. It's so cool. And they were just having a good time. I, I always appreciate songs where you can just tell the band is just messing around they're just having fun like it was for a laugh because then you're like you're kind of, it's like you're in on the joke you know what i mean yep and i feel like that song i my favorite part of that song for some reason is at the very end when like brian laughs when the girl dies mm -hmm. and you think it's like oh he's being an evil scientist and he's still in this character but it's just brian wilson finding this whole thing funny and being like hey play the play it back or whatever and you're like oh like cool all right like this was just a joke, but it's a cool track. And I love that they put the instrumental version on there too. Oh, me too. That's awesome. Yeah. And we'll, we we'll get there. But honestly, we don't. Have, I don't have much to add to that. I love the instru instrumental one too. Um, yeah. And the backing vocals to an extent are on it as well. Correct. That yeah. One. I I'm I don't know if we want to go track by track on all of those, but mm -hmm. I love the fact that they do. They have the snippets of the backing vocals instead of like full, you know what I mean? Cause they have a lot of stuff. They got to figure out what they're putting on, what they're not putting on. I also really like the fact that they're doing, here's the instrumental with the backing. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that for San Miguel specifically. I think oh, yeah. it's really cool. My solution. I mean, this is 
it's like you if you're watching this and you're either not like super knowledgeable about this era of the band have never heard a lot of these tracks before please do yourself a favor and a go listen to this stuff but also b check out my solution because it's just this is a song that i feel like beach boys fans hardcore have been talking about for a very long time yeah very long time and to actually have it officially released in this great quality is awesome um, this was recorded on halloween nights in 1970 and dennis is not on the track and a lot some people wondered why he's not on there david beard actually had an answer for that uh during one of the beach boys talk streams where he basically pointed out the fact that dennis wasn't on the track because he was away filming the Tulane Blacktop movie. Oh. So that's why he's not on the track. There's a really great article about Tulane Blacktop in the most recent issue of ESQ, actually. It's probably yeah. why he knows that. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of stuff for that movie. I've never watched that movie myself, but recently, like, I've been seeing more and more. Yeah. me. Well, I think either the writer or the director passed away this year. So I think people have talked about it. I, you know, what's funny is like a year ago, maybe two years ago now, mm -hmm. I bought the Criterion Collection edition of that movie because I'm like, it's it's Beach Boys related. I'll watch it at some. I still have never seen it either. It sounds like something I would do too. To be honest, I'll have it because I want to have it. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll watch this later. Well, because I don't know if you're a big Criterion guy. They're like 40 bucks usually for the nice Blu-ray and everything. But they do a sale twice a year at Barnes & Noble where it's half off. So, like, I'll go and I'll be like, all right, I'm going to stack up on the year. And I'll, I'll watch this in November and this in October, you know. Mm -hmm. That was one I just didn't get around to, I think. I'm always implored to say, yes, I will do that. But then <laughs> I know myself well enough to know that yeah. most of the time that doesn't happen. Or if it happens, I'll only go halfway and never never finish the act of actually watching it. But I do want to watch it. Will I actually get around to watching it anytime yeah. soon? I well, there's no Beach I Boys would, talk tomorrow. I would, so I would, now I have the time. Good, yeah, but I don't even have the physical copy. Unless it's streaming somewhere, I think I'm out of luck. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't even know. Seems I'd have like, to go find, hunt down a physical copy, and that's totally fine by me. But uh, Barnes and yeah, Noble. Tomorrow, tomorrow is a bit of a stretch for... for <laughs> The odds that I'll watch it by or get to watch it by then. Um, but yeah, also interesting, or it's kind of off track, but I want to point this out. Another connection that's interesting to so the movie producer, the producer of Tulane Blacktop was Gary Kurtz, the producer for Star Wars, the original and Empire Strikes Back in 1977. Oh, really? And of course, George Lucas really like re-popularized, I can't speak, um, He's not that word, but uh, he put the band's music in the public eye again. American, through American Graffiti. Graffiti. Yeah. So there's an interesting little connection there that I always found amusing and cosmic in a way, I guess. So um, next we have 4th of July. Another track. This is a Dennis track. This was actually released on the Good Vibrations box set of 93. Um. I don't think it's that much different on it. I don't. I didn't recall any difference from the '93 mix. Did you? Tell you the truth, never been a song that's ever jumped out at me. Me neither. It, but I think the reason why is this song has always, and the reason it has always been this way is because it pretty much is. This doesn't sound finished. Yeah. It, for it's sure. not finished. But it's one thing to not be finished. It's another thing to sound like it's not finished. You know what I mean? This sounds like it's not finished. And so as a result, I think mean, it's a nice melody. It's basically a variation, I think, of, does it make it good? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. It's, it's one or the other. It's either tough. make it good or um, cuddle up. But I think, actually think it's make, make it good. Um, yeah, I mean, I like this track. I don't love it. Even when I do like hypothetical surfs up mixes, like fan mixes of here's an alternate uh, timeline where these tracks made it instead of the other tracks that are actually on the album. And sometimes I'll have it on there, but most of the time I won't because there's better Dennis material to pick from, to be honest. Yeah. 
Not that this is bad, just never really grabbed me personally. Um, okay, and we have more Dennis tracks here, but all of these are pretty much previously released things. Uh, Sound of Free, this is always, this has been one of my favorite ones, like Dennis tracks for a very yeah. long time. I love it. I don't really have much to say about it. It's a rare song, I feel like, where Dennis, uh, he gravitated basically to these very moody and kind of deep romantic orchestral swell kind of songs. Yeah. And then rockers, like pretty ballads with like orchestral and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then rockers, like all I want to do, and it's about time. And then there's stuff like this, Sound of Free, that's kind of in the middle of that in certain respects. It's really more of a rocker than anything. It's closer to that, but it's not the same kind of rocker that it's about time or um, all I want to do are. It's very different. It's a little bit more poppy, but it's, it's beautiful. It has a great groove. Like you can really like get into the song very easily. So, you know, I love it. This is the 1970 single mix apparently. I cannot tell the difference between that and any other mix. Can you? Yeah, I I can't really tell either. Um, it's okay, such a great song. Can I? Sound, so the sound quality, but that goes without. Yeah. Sound. If you're expecting I, anybody watching this is expecting me to say that it's the sound quality every time. No, I I'll I, but I I'll stop now because like it goes without saying. But go on. Sorry. There's there's that like river song motif that he kind of re like he originally puts it in here a little bit and then there's it shows up again in that song all of my love and then obviously it's kind of I love that he just was obsessed with that that like bit that arpeggiated like chord I love it I just think it's great so and, sorry finish go ahead no that's pretty much it that's pretty much it okay yeah things that I've noticed having learned songs, okay, and these songs chord-wise on pianos, like the backing track specifically, which is the style that I do, it's not really full black backing track. It's not even piano solo backing track. It's just what the piano is doing. It's like backing track amalgamations. That's what I cover on the piano. And by doing that, you observe things that you maybe wouldn't if you're just doing the melody or things like that. And one of the things I've noticed very clearly is that the three Wilson brothers have very distinct styles in terms of the chords they tend to like to use. Carl is using a lot of G, C, and F chords in a lot of his early 70s songs. Brian, I mean, he's using all sorts of chords, but A and E chords are very common with him. F chords are very common with him, but like he uses everything, but like definitely those I listed. Brian um, Wilson's middle name is actually Slash Chords. Slash Chord, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. And Dennis also has his own chord style where he favors certain chords over others. And so you, you notice that the more that you learn these tracks, if you're just focusing on the melody or you're just listening, you may be able to detect this some of the time, just like, you know, I think, you know, you're right on and I, you don't need to be, have musical background necessarily to hear some of this stuff, the connections between this, but it still helps because there are songs and there are times where you wouldn't make that connection mm -hmm. if you didn't play the backing track on piano in this kind of amalgamation style. And it's just very interesting that they all have their own chords and things like that, that they tended to gravitate to. I mean, I'm learning right now and I'm gonna be posting a cover and tutorial of it pretty soon, but I'm learning feel flows. Nice. So, that will be my next piano tutorial. And, you know, Feel Flows has a lot in common with another song that I have not started learning. And I don't know if I'll do it anyway, because other reasons, but uh, Long Promise Road, same kind of chords. The Traitor, a lot of the same kind of chords. So, but you wouldn't necessarily think that just listening to Feel Flows and just listening to, um, long promised road it's like not clear from a listening perspective necessarily to the average listener very clear once you start learning this stuff you know yeah for sure it's it's interesting because like you said you can appreciate it and you can acknowledge it as a listener but learning it takes it to a whole nother level of appreciation yep 
there's stuff going on that's <laughs> just like yeah you never know unless you learned it in this specific style which is really close to the style of how these songs were composed from the onset, if you really think about it, hmm. uh, for piano-based composers. And Brian and Dennis were primarily piano-based composers. Um, yeah. Like it, it, it definitely adds to your appreciation of it and the connections and things like that. Um, but I just want to add that. Um, but getting back yeah, to it, sure. I love Sound of Free. I have nothing else to say about it. Um, <laughs> ditto this next track. Fallen in Love, a.k.a. Lady. Oh. This, so this is a more simple track structure-wise. It's also a very simple track in terms of lyrics. It's it's not it, very lyrically diverse, but doesn't mean anything pretty much because this song is still good, in my opinion. Very good. Arguably great. This is I, one I of those. Great, honestly. Yeah, this is one that for some reason I've known about for a while listening to it in this box set it just like grabbed me i cannot stop listening to it It'll like that it's it's one of my it's become one of my favorite dennis wilson compositions the like the i love her so can't let her go how it changes keys like oh it's it's so great and it's really simplistic and that drum machine at the beginning i'm obsessed with that sound like where did he get i have to i have to get in contact with david beard and be like you know what drum machine they used on this tell me because it's so cool it's such a i love that track i really do and it's very i agree with you it's very simple but like dennis is really good at just cutting through the bs and like getting to a point and it's raw he's his music is very raw and sincere Mm-hmm. In a in a way that Brian's is as well, but it's in a different way. Yep. Exactly. Where Dennis feels very like primitive in terms of music, but he's not. He's he clearly understands what he's doing. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just a great song. It's just a great song. You're spot on. And I also want to just add to that. I feel like there's a bit of a misconception or conception, but in my opinion, it's a misconception yeah. out there where People like to think that complex equals good. Yeah. With music. It's not necessarily true because a lot of time, the most memorable, enduring songs and melodies throughout history are the simple ones. They really are. And you think it's like, you know, happy birthday to you. I mean, nobody's going to be playing happy birthday to you on your car stereo necessarily, but like, you know, that song, it's a simple song and like you're never not going to know that song, so I don't, it doesn't mean it's bad. I get what you're saying. Yeah, like yeah, sunshine. It's just like there is a quality to the simplicity of of music that is a positive, and we don't have to constantly like make things more and more complex and equate that with good. Complex stuff often is good because there's so much going on around inside of it. No idea what that sound was. Um, <laughs> It has so much going on to appreciate, but at the same time, that's not one in the same with goodness, like what makes something good either, you know? I agree. Yeah, complex. I There's a lot of complex music that I appreciate, and there's a ton of complex music that I just, it just bores me because mm-hmm. it's more interested in, look at this, look how fast we're playing or look how cool this is. And it's like, I don't have any objection to being we- weird for the sake of being weird, but like, don't be boring. You know? Yeah. Well, as I like to say, and maybe I subconsciously picked this up from someplace else and just don't know about it, never realized it, but I often like to say to people, music is emotion encapsulated in sound. And it really is. I mean, you're communicating through music and the way that you're doing that primarily is through feeling. Yeah. I really like and it's something I feel like a Beach Boys fans in general understand, but maybe other people may not. And I've seen on the internet, I feel like I've seen stuff on the internet where I'm like, I don't know if this person really understands this. But like to me, music is not something to be analyzed up here. It's to be analyzed down here in your heart and really That's the perfect out. way to put it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just the people that approach music otherwise and like, okay. But to me, that misses the point of yeah. what music really is at its core. Um, but yes, 
I mean, Dennis is incredible. And this was one of his most prolific periods as a composer, if not the most prolific yeah. period. Lastly, on this disc, Seasons in the Sun. Oh boy, do I, or have I seen and have I heard and have I read so many people that have fallen in love with this song. And really? I, don't, I don't like, generally I don't like songs like this because they're a little bit too um, lightweight, as I like to say. <laughs> they're lightweight. It's, it's, it's a very sappy, yeah. It's a, yeah, but this is, I, I said this on my Instagram account one time. I think you saw it at, probably at some point. This song is really enchanting and kind of um, hypnotizing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I really like it. Despite I think it's not the music I like, I lo I really like this. What do you think? It's interesting because I I know the actual original version like first mm -hmm. and then here are the version, I guess, because the Beach Boys did it first and then it never came out and then someone else recorded it and it was a hit, right? Like that's... Yeah. That's that exactly. version is good. Like I know it. Carl singing it like adds a completely new dynamic to the song. I don't think it would have been a good fit for them as a single or like as a hit or something. I just it could have it could have been Kokomo before Kokomo. You know what I mean? Where it's like good song. Don't know if I would. This doesn't feel like a Beach Boys song to me, but it's not a bad song. Um, so I'm okay with them kind of keeping this one in the vaults. I find it super interesting that Al produced the remix or master of this from specifically for this box set? Yeah, I think, sitting on here, and I, I did, well, sorry, I just wanna look up the- Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't, he's not listed as the producer at, on what I'm looking at, but you're right that he was the remix, like he produced the remix. Or, yeah, yeah. I think Alan Boyd at one point basically just said like he was, he oversaw the, the mix of this for this set or so, something like that. Yep. Um, I have a lot of positive things to say about this track. I really, really like it. To your point about, you know, would it have been success? Would it have been Kokomo before Kokomo? Mm, I mean, it's impossible to tell, but I don't think it would have been. I think it would have been another one that just like was not noticed yeah. by virtue of, okay, this is by the Beach Boys. Nope, not listening yeah. to this because by that time, that's how they were. This was a dark period in the the time uh, of the band's existence, a dark period in the time of the band's existence where, uh, yeah, they were not, not popular at all amongst yeah. people in the States. So I don't think there was anything like that. Yeah. That could have changed that. Okay. And uh, then we get to um, the third disc and the first track on disc three is actually another sunflower promo oh, that's right, yeah so there's two on the box sets and i think there was actually both of these on the the preview snippets from the 1970 release so yeah. you know it's interesting hearing them both in full they're pretty like similar kind of style um if you know like you know just song snippet overdub of a voice advertising sunflower that's the beach boys in question not too much to say there it's a cool cool track um nice that they included that okay and then we get into uh some of the backing tracks and backing vocals so i feel like going one by one would be a little bit overkill in some cases because some of these are more interesting than others Sure. Um, do you want to like just pick out some of the ones that we both or you you pick out some of the ones that you want to talk about i'll pick some out uh out some yeah why don't you start i'm gonna go grab the list yeah okay um but in terms of sunflower um definitely all i want to do is one that i was like i couldn't wait to hear so the backing track and the backing vocals or the acapella or both both <laughs> both so for me both. it was both but it was mainly the acapella like yeah i had always said to myself when this set first drops the first thing i'm going to listen to is the acapella all i want to do and boy oh boy did did it deliver that's one of those tracks i can listen to 
for like a week straight and never get tired of listening to it. It's so yeah. good. It's it's amazing. And it's kind of crazy. Like, I think I had said this uh, earlier, but like Mike was really in like his prime songwriting in that in this period of time. Like he really was just writing some incredible stuff. Mm-hmm. And like even his vocal on that, and you you hear it more in the acapella version, like he's hitting some pretty high notes for his range. You know, like he clearly put a lot of effort into this song and it's it's frustrating to be like, damn, what would a whole album of songs like this from Mike have been like, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I myself and I know I'm not the only one out there for years. A lot of the high parts on All I Want to Do, I interpreted that I interpreted them as being Bruce, not Mike. Me too. Yeah. And they're actually Mike. There is is a thing that is, I think, Bruce um, in like kind of the, the choruses of the song there is a part that's bruce that's very up front and i i'm pretty sure that's him and not mike but is that the you know, my love is burning brightly part um because that i always thought might, was cool. it's, it might be it's either that or just the refrain of all i want to do over and over or both oh the, all i want to do yeah. yeah that's i think bruce not but Mike does the da 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 do 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 do, which that, I yeah. So that was a part I always interpreted as Bruce. Well, now we but know. Now we know. <laughs> now we know. Um, the acapella of this old world. I feel like was not on Made in California. It was on another box set. Uh, do you mean the backing vocals mix? What, do we really get a true acapella for that? I don't remember. I swear to God, there's there's one that exists for it. Maybe I'm just crazy. Sunflower said, I don't... Uh, Maybe it's not on here. No, I'm thinking of... Wait, just ignore me. <laughs> it's okay. I, I mean, I'll do no. that all the time, too, where I'll mix stuff, stuff up. But, like, there is an amazing backing vocals only version of uh, this whole world. And it's longer than the actual album track. You know, is that there's like an extra like 30 oh, yeah. something seconds or something like that. Let me see if I can look it up here. The exact time. Yeah, it's like 247 and the, the actual track on the album is sub two minutes by a little bit. So it's like an extra 50 yeah. seconds pretty much on the here. I really I got to say there's one song that I I think I overlooked when I first heard this album it was at my window. And hearing the, like, it's the instrumental track with the backing, hearing that on this is so beautiful. And there's a really great section of the uh, Endless Summer Quarterly issue on Sunflower where David Beard talks about that song. And I remember when I was reading that, I was like, maybe I've I've overlooked this song. And then when this came out and I heard it, I was like, no, I definitely did. The song is fantastic. Like, it's so good. You've got Brian speaking French. I mean, what more do you want? True. <laughs> Honestly, I'm still of the opposite mind, but I can be convinced. I mean, if you can be convinced that it's yeah. like, if you can change your mind, I'm sure I can. I'm just not there yet. There right are definitely now, songs I would describe that I've, At My Window is my least favorite Sunflower song. It's still mine, for sure. Yeah. I can, but now I can, like, I definitely have more of an appreciation for it. And I also think, like, this is going to be a controversial. So, well, I don't know. It might be. We've, I, I, B. I've expressed some controversial opinions. I, on the stream it's already, true. So go ahead. Sloop John B is my least favorite song of Pet Sounds. But I love Sloop John B. Like, I think it's an amazing song. And every time I hear it, I love it. Like, my heart is filled with joy. It just so happens to be the song on Pet Sounds I like the least. Well, it just doesn't, because, that's you know what understandable. What I mean? It doesn't really, it doesn't stop, like, it doesn't yeah. fit lyrically. It just comes out of nowhere. Of course. Like sonically it fits very well. And that's why I really like it and don't mind it. I'm not like you in that opinion, but I get that opinion. I get that opinion yeah. for anybody yeah. who claims that because, and you're not the only one who feels like that because I've heard but, that opinion elsewhere. Yeah. I think, I think there's a difference between I don't like a song and like, this is my, the song on the album that I like the least, like even the, the worst song off Sunflower is like still a fantastic song. Like, yeah, it's still super good, you know, but that's one that I really, I, I don't know if I did it consciously or not, but I really wanted to explore some of the songs that I didn't really care for as much with this box set. And I'm really glad I did. Yeah. I mean, same this, 
entire set has increased my appreciators appreciation of sunflower you know i was not really like i liked sunflower it was never one of my like top top favorites but now it's moved up it's it's in really? my top five it didn't used to be in my top five it used to be in my top 10 but not top five i would have to think about a top five huh let me hold on. You'll marinate I, on that and you'll let us I'll, know. I'll marinate and get back to you on a top five. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Our Sweet Love, anything with the backing tracks or backing vocals, that's all great stuff. I think I was spoiled a little bit and slash we as fans in general were, yeah. were spoiled a little bit when on Made in California, the there was a, a version of our sweet love with like the string arrangement and the backing tracks and back, tra backing track and backing vocals specifically. And I love that. So like, it's hard it, it, having already experienced that the versions on here, which I mean, I'm, they're pretty much the same more or less, but they don't have the same impact for me as they had hearing it the first time on made in California, but anything our sweet love two thumbs up from me. It's like that song is gorgeous. I think if I just to get back to you on this list thing, if I had to give it a ranking, I would probably say Sunflower is in my top three. It's in most people's uh, top three. Because <laughs> it's because that it's to so me good. is the it's, album. It's literally one of the best albums they ever did. Quality and it's really wise. it's really the only album they ever did where that feels like a proper Beach Boys album. Where every single that. member is represented. They're all, you know, it's not like as much as I love Pet Sounds, that is a Brian Wilson album featuring the Beach Boys. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And and to me, Sunflower is really them all getting kind of equal billing and time. And like, it's great. And it's fantastic. And Surf's Up is an extension of that somewhat. Not completely. But There's I think Sunflower is... Well, yeah. Sunflower is really the, the the album I'm like, this is what the Beach Boys could have been if they yep. had just like, I don't know. It's hard to keep up such a high level of quality. And that's what makes this set so amazing is that the quality yeah. is consistently right. up here. Yeah. And there's stuff sitting in the vaults for half a century that it's just got released. Better. What? Pardon? It's as good, if not better. Yeah, literally. You know, like, like, there's an extra album's worth of stuff, at least, if not more. Yeah. You know, and there's Dennis's stuff from Dennis's solo album, which we'll get to a little bit later. We will. But, yeah. you know, you got like three, four albums worth of incredible material here, potentially. And so the fact that, they, that a lot of this stuff just sat in the vaults yeah. for half a century is mind-blowing. But then again... This is the Beach Boys with, you know, Smile sat in the vaults for, you know, yeah. almost not quite that long, but almost that long, pretty much. And that's like the most amazing music I've ever heard and most amazing music on the planet, in my opinion. So yeah. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I can't help but be surprised still because <laughs> it doesn't make any yeah, sense. For sure. I was um, looking at the list for, for disc three and I just wanted to comment on two of the tracks very quickly okay from the and i got one i want to uh, comment on as well um for the the backing tracks so i'll get to the acapella stuff a little bit later but you go and yeah, yeah i'm just i'm doing the backing tracks as well mm -hmm. the alternate version of um slip on through is so good mm -hmm. the 69 one because they i don't know if you remember they put out that like three song ep yeah, I'm going um, your way. I'm going your way. Time. Yeah, which is a great song. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a version of "Slip On Through" on there, and I didn't. I didn't know if it was the same. And of course, they took that EP off iTunes. But I, I found it on my old iPod, and I like listened to it again. I was like, no, it's a little different. It's a little different. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's either the same take but shorter. I don't really know. But that take is fantastic. It's so right. so good. Um, the slide guitar on that is just beautiful. It's great. Just kiss. Yep. Uh, and then the other one, I'm I'm gushing, and then now I'm gonna just like <laughs> when girls get together. Oh yeah, this song. I'm not. A it fan. is. It is honestly 
my least favorite Beach Boy song, I think, ever. I would rather yeah. listen to Hey yeah. Little Tomboy twice than listen to it. I would oh, rather listen gosh. to anything off Summer in Paradise. I hate this song so much. It annoys because it starts off with like, wing, and you're like, ugh. Like, well, the lyrics to me don't have anything to say and yeah. don't really do anything functionally either. And then the and the version on Keeping the Summer Alive is a minute longer than the one they recorded on, on Sunflower. They somehow made it longer. Yeah. As you, if that were going to happen. The thing, the other things that bother me about this song so much, and I wouldn't go as far as saying it's my least favorite ever, although I understand like that perspective, but personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far for me. But the other things that really like make this song a stinker for me, like one of the few songs I would say, okay, I'll listen to, but like I can't get into it any on any level, um, is the fact that there's no variation really like the vocal the melody line is following the track pretty much pretty much straight i mean there's a little bit of bobbing and weaving but not much it's literally just following the same kind of pattern that the track itself is following which sometimes that's fine but in this case it comes off as boring it's like it's it's not really doing anything interesting and you have a phenomenon that I don't like with beach, certain beach, and there's not many Beach Boys songs that fall into this category. Um, South Bay Surfer from Surf, Surf and you, uh, Surfer Girl, excuse me, yeah. 1963 did the same thing. Two leads singing the exact same thing in unison and not deviating at all. <laughs> you, it, it's that brutal. sounds like under two minutes. Doubled. Who else is on this track? Because it's somebody else too, along it's- with Bruce. There is, with South Bay Surfer, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. I think. With this one, it, it's like, it just feels like it never ends. And I also feel like, like going off of what you said, where it's like, it feels unfinished. And I, if this was just a random song on a box set, I would listen to it and go, okay, this was an idea they had. They didn't fully, you know, wasn't fully formed, whatever. But this is a, a completed released song that was on a studio album that is somehow, again, longer and feels unfinished. It just doesn't feel like a complete song. It feels like a sketch. Um, You're exactly right. But am I crazy? Is it Bruce on that? That's Bruce, On When Girls Get Together? Yeah, he's singing lead. With Mike? It's It's definitely... It's Mike, and is it, well... I I don't listen to that song very often. I feel like I'm going crazy, because I don't recall, like... I'm, I always listen to that and I think I hear Bruce, but it's not necessarily Bruce because it could be just like yeah. Mike and Brian potentially just a, or Mike, I don't know, Mike and Al. Yeah, I, I always thought it was Brian, but I could definitely be wrong about that. Um, it could be Brian on there too, but if, it, if Brian's one of them, I feel like there's another like lead, like it falls into that yeah. same category where there's two people singing at the same time. It's not like a reverb. It's not like an echo. It's yeah. literally two people sing, singing in, uh, in sync with one another. So I always hear Bruce, and then I'm never sure who that second person is, but um, maybe I'm wrong about Bruce, too. Who the heck is on that track? It doesn't even matter. It's just now that I'm talking about it. No, it's just always, driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy, yeah. So those were the two tracks you want to talk about for the, the backing track, first kind of section of disc three. I want to talk a little bit about the alternate version where is it on here i saw it um i just want to make sure that i've gotten like it's on here yeah here okay track 13 of disc three pool pool water alternate 2019 mix oh yeah so uh mark lynette's and Alan Boyd, I, I guess, but I, I definitely Mark Lynette. Um, I forget where they said this. It was obviously one interview that they did. Uh, said that, you know, it was kind of showing, like it, it was meant to show this particular like version of it is meant to show it like it, just a different angle of the song. Mm. Honestly, like I know what they're talking about, but to me, it's still cool, cool water. But I actually want to just take a moment. And I know this is really nerdy but some Beach Boys fans out there will appreciate what I'm about to do. And as I want to talk about the history of this track for a little bit, 
because this has this is a track that has one of the more interesting histories um, in the Beach Boys discography because there's a lot of people who don't really know or think they know but actually don't know the actual history of this particular song because this song cool cool water on sunflower that was you know the first iteration of it that was released uh chronologically and like the real the first time people heard that and then it became on brian wilson presents smile uh, in blue hawaii and so people associate it with like the element suite of smile oh it was supposed to be it's water basically and it's not water it was never so it's water on the modern day smiles it's never water on the smile like it was never intended to be water back when smile was being worked on back when that song was composed and first recorded do you know about this by the way did not know that no so here's the actual history of the track you know the, how the the song is known as love to say dada on smile okay yeah so for many years like people didn't know this and then steven desper ironically enough was responsible for a lot of the, the set we're talking about of course um on smiley smile he made a post and he talked about the history of cool cool water and how it morphed from love to say dada into cool cool water and, and what was that like like how did that happen and he basically said that love to say dada was originally about a baby hence the title love to say dada and the wah wah backing vocals the, the ones i think that's brian it's either oh, brian or carl but i'm pretty sure it's brian yeah that's not wah wah as in water water like wah the first syllable of water that's oh it's in like a baby it, really. it's it's baby sounds that's what he was doing <laughs> that's so funny so i did not know that yeah so when brian composes and you know there's an excerpt in the smile sessions box that if you have the big five cd one if you open up the the book inside there and read some of the excerpts from people one of them uh, of course is from marilyn uh brian's first first wife um and she talks about how you know people people sometimes ask her or have asked her over the years is it true that brian like filled a baby bottle full of chocolate milk and was sucking on it you know like a baby when he was like <laughs> working on love to say dada and she's like yeah it's true and all of that makes perfect sense and in fact and i did not catch this i actually have to credit whoever wrote this on wikipedia which i i don't know the exact second because i don't have this in front of me but Somebody on Wikipedia pointed this out. If you listen to the Smile Sessions, like the full five CD version of it, or the full box set version, and you go and you listen to the recording sessions for Love to Say Dada, keep in mind, that was one of the last tracks worked on for Smile. Mm -hmm. Chronologically, it was one of the later tracks composed for the album. It was composed in 1967, not 1966. Uh, Van Dyke had long left the project by the time it, was conceived but somebody whoever wrote this on wikipedia about it and the right i did catch this after i read this i'm like oh it is there if you listen at a certain point on one of those one of those two um recording sessions that's included the musicians the session musicians they play a little bit of a snippet just randomly out of the blue of child is father of the man as they're working on the song and bear in mind child is father of the man had been worked on, I mean, that song was conceived way earlier in, in Smile, and a lot of the work actually took place in December of 66. Um, I believe it was worked on again towards the end around the same time, but at the same time, you know, all this stuff, to me, that clearly, like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of, like, making a little bit of a leap here, but it's a very logical leap to make that this song really was more in the vein, or like conceived by Brian as being more in the vein of, you know, wonderful child as father man, what yeah. became a uh, song for children on Brian Wilson presents smile, but originally was not like that when it was just look or, you know, really arguably was pretty much like not likely to be on the album anyway. Um, it was quickly worked on and then kind of forgotten about. Um, Surf's up, it's the, the cycle of life suite that it was really kind of conceived to be a part of almost, if you want to think about Smile in terms of like being sweet based, which 
Yeah. You can argue if, if that's an anachronism as well, but you know, Brian has talked about suites in various capacities. So, and clearly like there's songs that are meant to fit together stylistically and say stuff. I mean, the elements suites, the elements like that in itself is that concept. And that was not an anachronistic later on kind of invention. That was something was that was talked about during the smile session. So I don't put too much stock into people who say, um, that sweets were not really a thing. They weren't going to be like sweets like the Brian Wilson presents Smile, where like they're, they're, they would segue into one another um, seamlessly. No, 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 no. Uh, that's not what I mean. But like how they were grouped and how they were conceived, they were meant to flow a certain way. Um, and so that is, I think, a very logical conclusion to make that love to say Dada belong to the cycle of life sweets in Smile. Then what happened is as Smile turned into Smiley Smile, the, the track kind of stopped, like basically like he put it to the side. And at some point prior to Wild Honey being released, but I think either during the, the Smiley Smile sessions or afterwards, Carl brought the tapes or got the tapes and he and Steven kind of worked on the song and somehow, I forget what Steven said in this post, but it morphed into Cool Cool Water at that point, post smile sessions. And a lot of it was actually, if I remember it correctly, which I don't have this in front of me right now, but um, a lot of the idea of, of turning it into a song about water was Carl hmm. more than anybody else. And so, eventually it was actually there's a version of, of wild honey that was supposed to have cool cool water on it that a very ver early version of it got rejected it didn't get rejected actually it was the way that it worked was it was supposed to be released by brother records and uh i don't know what happened i'm not sure if anybody in the fan community actually knows what happened here but uh it didn't get released on brother it got released on capital and when that was decided upon some of the lineup of like which tracks would be on the album changed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it wasn't on wild honey, but you know, three years later, roughly it finally appears on uh, sunflower this, you know, the album here. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a condition actually of, not a condition, but like, it was kind of like, you know, it's like a carrot dangled in front of like Warner reprise, the executives, they were like, ah, smile. I really, I really like, like, I want to hear more of that style or something like that. It's like a very early, um, like we want, like, want to hear this. We wanted to see like good vibrations, that kind of style. And one of the executives, and again, I say this over and over, I don't have this in front of me, but one of the executives was like, I want this on the album. I want, like I'm, I, I want to hear this. And yeah. um, when they heard it, they were like, yeah, this is a plus material. What I so find it's a very interesting history. And then of course it became in blue Hawaii decades later. With Carl really seems to be the main reason why a lot of these smile songs are put on the records, whether it be cool, cool water or cabin essence on 2020 or surfs up on surfs up. Like he's the driving force behind this. And yet, in the 80s, when they talk about Brian wanting to finish Smile and, and Mark Lennett does his his mix of it in, I think, 88, yep. Carl's the one that shoots that down. You know, so what changed? Was it Landy? Was it, you know, was it... I, to me, the, the Landy thing really is the only reason why that would... I was about to say, when you said Landy out loud, I'm like, wait a minute. Landy makes sense because... You know, yeah. look what Landy did to Brian, the effect he had on him. And then yeah. that could have like triggered, you know, b bad memories basically of, of the smile sessions and what it did to Brian. And um, yeah. that might have something to do with it pretty heavily, actually, now that you mentioned that. That's a good idea or a good. I, I don't know if I showed you this. I found something really, really weird at, uh, at I used to work at a bookstore and I found something very strange and I immediately snatched it. I gotta see if it's over here. Oh yeah. But it is the Underground Dictionary by Dr. Oh my Eugene gosh. Matthew. 
that and, how you you've you bought Lamy's book. <laughs> well, his other book. His I other bought book. his other book because I have the other. I read the other one. <laughs> that book, the wouldn't it be nice autobiography? Autobiography. It's a trip. It's really a trip to read. I am like, proud to say I don't own it and have never read it, and I don't plan on reading it or owning it anytime soon. It's one of the only Beach Boys books I will say that about. I got to tell you, though, it's it's fascinating. It oh, really I'm sure it is. I actually it's have uh, The Wilson Project. Have you ever read that? Gary Usher's, it's based on Gary Usher's diaries from working with Brian in the Whoa, 80s. Oh, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, pick that. So I have not read it yet. I have it, though. It's like right. in my other room behind where my computer is. So, and it's, it's his diaries or it's based off of his diaries? It's based off his, of his diaries. It was published post his death. He died in, I believe, 1990. And so Stephen okay. J. McFarland, who's authored some s- number of incredible books. Um, yeah, you're writing his name down. He wrote, writing it down, he wrote, yeah. He wrote the, the book. He basically compiled, like he get, took Usher's diaries and he basically crafted the book around those. Wow. Um, but you do read the, the diaries themselves. Like, it's not like he altered God. them or you're reading them. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. literally there for you to read. I have to, I didn't know that existed. Yeah. Um, I gotta, I gotta read that one of these days. I just have not had a ton of time, but yeah, yeah that's cool, cool water. And you know, this is a great <laughs> ultimate look at it. Um, but I just, I, I, I like to geek out on that stuff. So when I saw that this is on, you know, of course, I know this is on disc three and I saw this look, looking at the track list here was reminded of that uh i'm like yeah i got i got to nerd out for a moment here san miguel is the other one that i love on here um i mean there's so many that on this backing track section that we could just talk about ad nauseum and i we we i think we got to move on though no they're all awesome and i don't think we have a lot to say about them other than it's just cool to hear songs that we know and love in different ways like i envy mark lynette so much that he gets to just mess around like imagine you have access to the master tapes of these songs you get to like i want to hear just the guitar part and the drum part and like i don't know it's just it's just a cool thing to like let us in on that just a little bit where we get to hear these backing tracks and these the backing vocals and i think it's a really smart idea by the way to do it with it's the instrumental and the backing vocals Mm -hmm. so you get to kind of especially with san miguel i i had noticed this and then Mark Lynette said something in an interview and I'm like, I'm glad that he brought this up. In San Miguel specifically, I've never really noticed Mike's bass part, his his lower vocal part. It's just kind of something you feel in the track. In the instrumental, you, you hear it like very prominently and it's great. I really, really love it. And it's just one of those things where I just, you know, I'm glad it exists. I appreciate it. And now that you brought that up, that reminds me of another my Mike Love bass vocal that I it really gets brought up front. I, I don't I don't think I've ever noticed it really on all I want to do, even though I've I've listened to that song a ton. But there is a low Mike Love backing vocal, the bass part, where he's repeating all I wanna do at certain intervals. So he's doing the the lead vocal and he has parts in the backing vocals, which is not uncommon. There are other plenty of other Beach Boys songs where that actually happens. Um, yeah. like I think Don't Worry Baby is an example of one where Brian is both the lead and the back in the backing vocals yeah. um, but it's so subtle and buried it kind of gets lost in things that are going on at that at those points that he's singing that and I'm like wow I never noticed that before and that's the thing about Beach Boys music and you know why it's so rewarding to get to hear these and also just rewarding to listen to this and stuff in general, no matter what it is, um, Beach Boys related, you're always discovering new things about it. It's just layer upon layer and, you know, you listen to it over and over again and you could be, you know, a thousand listens in and you're like, oh, that's a new part. I never noticed that. It's just, you know, I'm almost speaking the obvious to, to a lot of hardcore fans right now, but it's one of these things you like, you never, you never fully wrap your mind around almost, you know? For sure. Why is it, why is this the case? Yeah. How can I listen to this song for like, like 10,000 times for the 10,000th <laughs> time? And I'm just now realizing there's a part in here I never noticed. Um, 
It's incredible. So do you want to move on to the next part of, of the third disc, which is uh, the acapella versions? Definitely. Of, I believe this is uh, still Sunflower stuff, the acapella stuff. But like, we already talked about all I want to do. We were just talking about that. Um, the other ones that I want to talk about really is actually, well, we already also talked about like this whole world as well. That was I, that. Yeah, I was going to bring that up and I was like, we, I think we did already, but it's yeah, so we good. Did just a little while ago. Um, it's about time is like, eh. like, I love that song. And I like the fact that we have the backing track and just the backing vocals. That's great. But I don't feel like it revealed a ton to me. I don't know. What did you think of that one? I think these are all short enough where I'm like, I can just enjoy them. And like, I'm not annoyed by their space on it. You know what I mean? It's like, if yeah, the it's like, so this, things, is like a, all right. this is, this one is just a, an excerpt. So it's a very small, yeah. but like, the snippets were a smart decision, I think. Yeah. Um, personally though, I listened to that and I didn't find that there was much buried beneath what I had already heard, at least not yeah. to my ears. Um, but anyway, like there's not much to say here. The forever acapella mix, we've also kind of heard, but there's also a version on here that has alternate vote, like an alternate line. And it might be this acapella version, potentially. Gotta, I think so, yeah. It might be another version that I'm just forgetting, but it's gotta be, it's gotta have the vocals on it. So, um, and it's not marked, I'm trying to think here. Yeah, it's got to be this one. There's no other option. I think it is this. That uh, alternate Dennis line. I forget how it goes, but the child, like the child of love, I forget like the exact line, but like that was interesting because I was not expecting to hear. Yeah. Again, I line. love the whole like, this is a, an avenue they went down and decided to change. I really just like hearing what, didn't make it on to the th like the process of recording a song and making the song and like Dennis throwing out a lyric that in the moment maybe he thought was better but like in the end of the day like decided to change I don't know I just really think that's cool and I, I love that he was doing that mm, yep ditto all right so we'll move on to disc four make it headway yeah uh <laughs> this is the surfs up sessions section uh, so we can kind of do the same kind of thing. We can kind of pick out, I think, sure. some standout alternate versions and backing versions that we really loved, each of us. Um, I'll start. Obviously, I love hearing the track and the backing vocals to, to Long Promise Road. I've said yeah. before, that's my favorite Carl song, even though I'm called Feel Flows 409 on, online. I love, I love both songs, but like, if I had to say which one do I prefer, which one is my favorite of the two, it's Long Promised Road. Um, okay, here's one I want to talk about. Take a load off your feet, the alternate vocal version. Me too, man. I prefer this version. Do you? I, I don't know if I prefer it, but it's I different. love it. It's so yeah. good. And I'm I'm a big fan of the alternate takes. Give me the alternate versions of everything. Like, this is so cool, and it's it's weirder. It's a weird song to begin with, too. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm here for it. Yeah, I remember that was one of the last. For whatever reason, that was one of the last tracks off the box that I heard because mm -hmm. I didn't listen to it the first time in order. I was just like, "Ooh, let's listen to this," and then you know, and I was like, kind of going, and then I second listen, I listened to it in order. But that was one that I listened to towards the end. Uh, mm -hmm. And it surprised the hell out of me. And it's great. Oh, it's so good. A couple of things I want to point out about that track. First off, Al's vocal towards the beginning sounds so much like Brian. And you need to listen to it yeah. like a, a couple of seconds longer than you might think to realize, oh, that's Al. But like he sounds exactly like Brian that first line and a half or so. Um, I like the fact that Al kind of goes into that lower register, which we rarely hear. We'll hear it elsewhere on another Al track a little bit later that we'll talk about, but- um, We did that in the that, bridge, right? In the- he Yeah, does that, if like, you wanna do the right thing, thing for him, and yeah. then he gets back up into the higher register, just take a walk, walk in the grass. Love that because 
I don't know. It's just, I like it when songs do that, where it's like, it's bobbing and weaving and going up and down and um, not staying in one kind of tonality, but just doing yeah. interesting things. Uh, so I like it when songs do that. And it's a little bit more understated. The other thing I'll say about like, probably why I prefer this uh, overall to the, to the album track uh, the, the version that appeared on Surf's Up, of course, originally. There's actually two reasons. One, uh, I, I've always described the Surf's Up version, uh, you know, the actual proper version of Take a Load Off Your Feet as being basically vegetables, you know, the smile version of vegetable vegetables <laughs> without the self-awareness. In other words, vegetables is a silly song and it knows it's a silly song and it revels in it. it like that's kind of the point. Yeah. It, it's self-aware. Take a load off your feet always struck me as like, okay, it's a silly song, but I don't know if it knows it's a silly song, <laughs> you know, just listening to it. I mean, that, that sounds almost very odd because you have the sound effects, you have, you know, there's, there's all kinds of weird stuff, but at the same time, I feel like it does take itself seriously. And it just always struck me as odd. And I feel like, this version's a little bit zanier, but more understated. And for some reason, that just jives with me better. Um, I, I don't want to say it's like less weird or, or more self-aware necessarily, but the more understated aspects of this version strike me as, I don't know, it's more palatable, I guess, to me personally. Am I making any sense to you? No, I, I honestly, I never thought of that before. That's a really great point that it is, it is pretty straightforward. And I, I wonder if that was maybe Jack Riley kind of saying, you know, don't, don't play it up as hammy and kind of do it more seriously. Cause I think it works. It works both ways. I think the one on the album works because I personally love things that are a little like too, they take themselves too seriously. And then like, you kind of are laughing at it, but not yeah. in a not in a mean way. It's just kind of like my my favorite is um, Al singing "Toothpaste and Soap Can Make Our Oceans a Bubble Bath," mm -hmm. and don't because he like really goes for it with that line, and it's such a silly lyric, but like he he owns it, and that's I I appreciate it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I I think there's a merit to like really like taking something silly seriously which I appreciate, but I also think this alternate version, like you're saying, it's very goofy. And I think that's like, it, it's interesting to see how it started off as this goofy thing and kind of got a little bit more serious. Yeah, um, agreed. The other thing I noticed about this version versus the, uh, the actual version on Surf's Up that came out back in 71, of course, originally, is obviously there's a lack of Brian on this version. It's just Al throughout. Okay. And there is a very, I don't know if this is like an effect that they, it's got to be an effect. It has to be actually now to say that it's stupid to say otherwise. It's an effect on Brian's voice, um, a processing kind of effect that kind of has a delay. You know what I'm talking about? There's like a little bit of a delay to his vocals on the Surf's Up version of this song. Yeah. And it's not that I, well, I shouldn't say I don't like it, but I also don't like it. <laughs> It's not that I like it. I also yeah. don't like it, but it's like, I don't know. It, it sticks out and almost when you pay it, like when you hear it and when, when you really focus on it, when it's like pointed out to you, oh, it's, this is what's happening. Like there's that echo effect, almost that delay. Uh, it's hard not to notice it. And it just bothers, it's bothered me over the years listening to that. Um, <laughs> I don't hate it. Yeah. Uh, Take a load off your feet actually is not a track that I ever skip on Surf's Up. But yeah, I, I prefer What's one that you skip on Surf's Up. Pardon? What's one that you skip on Surf's Up? Sometimes it's student demonstration time. Not always. I'll right. sometimes listen to it, but it's if, if there's any one song, it's it's that one. Yeah. Mine is welfare song. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're making that face because you you think you know that I consider that to be Al's best song. Wait, re no, really? Are you serious? You think that's I'm his serious. best ever? 
is his best written song. Huh? No, I did. I honestly did not know that. I mean, to me, That's it's so either that or it's California Saga. But can you elaborate I, on this? No, I don't think we've ever talked about this, Scott. I don't know. I don't know if I can actually articulate why I think that. It's okay. just got a very. It's. I like the melody. I like the understated, almost um, minimalistic arrangement of it. Yeah. It's a really good Al vocal. It's not the greatest Al vocal, but it's it's a really good one. Um, I I don't know. This sounds silly because it's just a moment in the song. But I've always liked the the panning effect that happens when he's yeah. doing the the scat vocals. Ba, 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 that panning effect. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, but I don't know if I can describe why I think of it as this his best written song. It is based in part on a melody that is, as you would imagine, a folk melody, knowing Al and his <laughs> love of folk music. But yeah, and it's just so unusual because yeah, the lyrics make reference to, I mean, the lyrics are like, okay, it's describing the the hardships of trying to survive. And I never knew this until recently. I think Al pointed this out in an interview uh, within the past year, maybe, or plus, or even, he might even say in the liner notes, actually, I'm not sure where I read this initially, but um he talks about Bess, like Bess and me, who is Bess referring to? And it's like this, I forget her name, but a 30s singer, Bess, I forget the last name. Was it Bessie Smith? Might have been, yeah. Yeah. And I just, I like those little things. And that always struck me. It's like, who is singing this? And from yeah. what perspective? I don't know. It's always struck a chord, pun intended, with me. And I, you're not the first person I've heard who, who has said that you don't like uh, a welfare song. Because when I appeared on Beach Boys Talk, this was back in April that I appeared on it as a, as a guest, um, like Greg mentioned that, that he doesn't like that either. Or not that he didn't like that, he doesn't think that that's true at all. But like, I think later when they did the Surf's Up analysis with David Beard, that episode, um, he was like, that was the weak point of this album. Like, I don't, I don't like his vocals on this at all. And so, and he, he pointed this to this song basically as like one of his least favorite on this album. And then this album is already like, his one of his least favorites. He's a big uh, non-enthusiast of, of yeah. Surf's Up to say the least. I, I remember when we saw Brian Allen Blondie at Beacon Theater, mm -hmm. two years ago almost actually. 2019. And I have snippets of that show on my YouTube channel, which this will probably, this will wind up on the YouTube channel, part of yeah. it anyway, in the end. But sorry, go ahead, just plug in. Um, and when they, did, when they did Welfare Song, that was one of those that I was like, really, the two songs that I walked away from that night that were, I was like, sold on was that one and when the zombies did uh butcher's tale because that's one i've always skipped on odyssey and oracle and chris white singing that like got me you know um but al singing welfare song was, was really really cool when he performs it live it's great but it's also very different because there's all these like studio effects on yeah. the, the album version and which is which is weird because again the song itself is actually very understated in terms of its arrangement it's not a bombastic kind of arrangement at all it's very subtle in how it presents itself and minimalistic but when you hear it in, in concert al like his solo shows he he hasn't not, hasn't done the these um solo shows in a bit because of the pandemic obviously and he stopped doing welfare a will of uh, he stopped doing a welfare song like in 2018. So like it was fairly early on when he was starting up these solo storyteller shows that he just stopped performing it. But like it was him and a, an acoustic guitar basically. And that was it. And even with like Brian's backing band, it still sounds more understated. Yeah. You know, than it arguably you would think it should, which is not a bad thing, but- It's just a thing. It's just a thing. <laughs> but that's it, it, well, yeah 
it's very interesting to me that you you're like the second person to say you know like you skip a welfare song and don't like it don't care for it um i mean so when you got an album that has, track though i i you know, agree yeah. like it doesn't stand out but then again it's wedged between <laughs> feel flow is arguably carl's best song and brian's sweets which is a masterpiece of three songs in a row afterwards yes. so like yeah, of course, it doesn't really stand out. It's a those competition, songs. yeah. Yeah. Um, were there any other ones that really jumped out at you? Before you answer that, though, I also want to give a huge, like, uh, I, I want to praise Feel Flow's track and backing vocals. Like, they released that pretty much the week prior to the, the box set releasing. And boy, do I love hearing that. It's just, oh, it's the track itself, obviously. The background harmonies are just mind blowing. And it's all Carl. It's a wall of Carls, basically, are the backing vocals. There's nobody else on there vocally. All of that is Carl. Um, just over, like over and over, recording all the parts and creating that. So that's just amazing. I also want to shout out to it because uh, I'm working on my own. Uh, piano accompaniment version of the backing track. And that has proven to be a very useful tool. Good timing, by the way. Of course, you need good yeah, timing. That's right. the beat toys themselves have sung and, you know. That's what me and, me and the guys from my band want to cover Funky Pretty really bad. Mm -hmm. But we're waiting for the acapella version to come out, hopefully next year, mm -hmm. so we can kind of analyze it and do all the vocal parts. So Mark Lynette. Hurry up. <laughs> yes. Oh, that'll be good. That'll be awesome to hear. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah. Rattle shake. That's true. That coming, coming next year. It's it's all in Mark's hands, honestly, at this point. Uh, I mean, I would have to think that that would be one of the tracks that they do in acapella. They, have, they so. have to, right? Um, I wrote a song uh, a couple of months ago that had half the melody of uh, Funky Pretty. Oh, and I was like playing it. And then one of our friends was just in the room. He's like, oh, that's Funky Pretty. I was like, <laughs> like, I was like it was so mad. <laughs> but anyway, it's a great song. Not what we're here to talk about, but it's a great song. Um, in terms of the, the Surf's Up stuff. Um, I'm just realizing, by the way, there's more stuff on, on this section of this for that I want to talk about, but you, you go sure, first. Yeah. Student demonstration time is, it does not need to be on here. Can we agree to that? Yes. It, that could have been a snippet. It didn't need to be a four minute because it's a blue, it's just a regular blues song. And when it goes, do, 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 and there's just silence and you're like, all right, like, <laughs> why do we have a four minute version of this? Well, the point um, of these is it's supposed to like, like show you the layers, like un undo yeah, the layers, yeah. all the layers and, and make you hear those various components a lot more clearly and up front. And for a track like that, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't, really like, need it doesn't it, accomplish yeah. that at all. In my um, opinion. This is the disc that has the version of Surf's Up where it's Brian's 67 vocal, right? It's that attempt. Yes. So it was December 66, actually. But yes, that is the one that it, you're correct. And that's one of the ones I want to talk about. But you That's first. fascinating. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's super. I'm so glad they put it on here again as a part of the process of them trying to utilize Brian. Cause I never, I always wondered had they tried to use Brian's original vocal or if they, Carl was just like, I'm going to do the whole thing or like why they ended up at that conclusion. And I, I think it's really cool that like, they show that they really tried to do it with this and then it just didn't work, you know? Right. So I'm going to plug myself a shameless plug again, because I did a video on the history of Surf's, Ups, uh, of Surf's Up's lyrics and the evolution of the lyrics because there are differences between the versions over time. The original 66 lyrics that you know you hear on the Brian lead vocals, which any vocal, uh, any version that uses Brian's lead vocal on the first part and the second part really, the second movement of the song is all Brian and the piano demo from December 66. What Brian is singing is not necessarily what like the, the lyrics of Surf's Up the album, like they printed the lyric sheets in the album. That's not actually 
like there's a point where it's like the glass was raised, the fire rose. And that's the lyrics that you you see on that sheet. And in the vinyl version, they actually reproduced that, although not as like an insert, but like as a, they produced it inside the gatefold. They made it like a gatefold lyric stuff. But that was an originally an insert. And like Brian's not singing Fire Rose. That's not the lyric that he's singing. He's not singing that at all. He's singing Fire Roast. The glass was raised, the fire rose, the fullness of the wine, the dim last toasting. And that's like a big, like one of the only differences between like the lyrics as they're printed and what Brian is singing for the second movement. But for the first movement, the one that wasn't used on Sarah's Up, like there's some more differences than I think most people realize. And I did an entire video on that not that long ago, actually. So check out that video for anybody who's interested in like learning about the different versions and what Brian is actually singing because any version that has Brian on the first movements of the song like his original lead vocal, that's all the same lead vocal. That's all the same performance. It's that one December 1966 performance. And so- That's the Leonard Bernstein thing, right? Yeah, it, it is. Um, well, no. So it's kind of interesting actually. So yes and no, because that performance, the it was made for that originally, but like the video version that was actually aired in like April of the following year, that was a different performance. It's not one the same, but literally they were done like a day apart, roughly a day or two apart. So they're very similar, but they're not exactly the same performance. No. Um, but regardless, it, that demo version, uh, that lead vocal, even it's, it's it's not the same as the the April version that was aired, but uh, it's you know similar. And literally, like every version that is a studio version, a studio released version, if it has Brian on the first movement as the lead vocalist, it's from that demo performance from December of 1966. And so, no matter what. That's the performance. So if you can, if you know what Brian's singing, uh, he's singing those exact words for every version, no matter what you're you're listening to. So this version is, and I always interpreted it this way because uh, this occurred to me basically from the moment that uh, the snippets, the seventy, we we've talked about those a ton, but like late last year, twenty twenty, they released snippets for copyright purposes, and then they yanked them back down because you know, this was going to come out at that, a little bit later the next year, of course, that was the plan. Um, and they just did that for legal purposes. But the intent here, as I always interpreted it, was this is Mark Lynette's attempt at showing or trying to reconstruct what the original plan for Surf's Up was. In other words, Carl never planned on, like Carl singing the song was plan D. Plans A, B, and C were all involving Brian singing the lead throughout. First off, there was a plan to have Brian re-sing his lead vocal because the problem was his lead vocal on the demo version, timing-wise, it doesn't sync up with the studio backing track because the lead was never meant to be a lead vocal. Um, and you can tell that just from listening to the lead vocal. There are parts of it where like timing's a little off or he doesn't quite like, uh, emphasize or kind of stay on certain lines long enough. You know, it's safe to say, and Brian himself has said this in the past, he doesn't think highly of his lead vocal for this, for Surf's Up. And I mean, it makes perfect sense when you consider what I'm saying here, which yeah. is it was never a lead vocal. Like that wasn't the intent. It was just a demo track. So he wasn't like singing it seriously in the sense that he wasn't trying to sing to the backing track or make this an official version um, this was just something he was doing for a TV show as a, like a preview. And yeah, th so the idea was, okay, we can't get the lead vocal once we isolate it to sync with the backing track, the studio backing track from 66. So that was plan A. That didn't work. Plan B is, okay, let's get Brian right now, five years later, basically, to re-sync the lead vocal. That didn't work because Brian refused and wasn't interested. Uh, Stephen Desper has said many times it was like Brian was afraid of the song basically and um, that makes sense if you know your Beach Boys history and kind of the effect that the smile sessions had on Brian in terms of 
just it's collapse and it not working out. It really like, I mean, listen, people might think I'm referring to like drugs. I'm not, I'm actually referring to the fact that he had to shell this thing. This is the most, ama- like I said before, Samad is the most amazing music ever in my book. It's his masterpiece. He's called it his masterpiece. He knows it's amazing. Um, there's a video on my YouTube channel where uh, it's a snippet from the uh, bonus features of um, the Beautiful Dreamer documentary that David Leaf made. Short little snippet where he's asked about uh, to compare pet sounds and smile with one another. And he's basically says, you know, smiles a 10, pet sounds a four when you put them right next to each other and compare them. So like he knows this is his masterpiece. And to have to shelve that could you imagine, okay, yeah. you make that music, you make this incredible, it's your your greatest creation ever, mind-blowing stuff, and you know it, and you have to shelve it, not because you want to, but because it feels like the entire world is against you, and you just can't fight against the entire world at a certain point, because that's what it felt like, I'm sure, to Brian, after everything he had to deal with, which, again, wasn't just drugs, it's like an overly simple answer. Like, no, 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 no. There's a lot going on that went to, against Brian and against the Beach Boys in general. That was, it almost felt like, you know, they were being sabotaged by supernatural forces almost. And <laughs> knowing Brian, I'm not, I, I would think that maybe he thought that probably for a yeah. good while. It makes sense why he's afraid, he would be afraid of it. And this is one of his, like the one of the best songs on Smile. It was supposed to be the centerpiece of the album. So he was like, I want nothing to do with this. Makes makes perfect sense. And then the other thing is later on, and we haven't gotten to it yet chronologically in talking about this, although it sh- it's coming up soon, but there's the remake track. They tried remaking the track, the first movement. And uh, I guess we'll just jump ahead and talk about that for a moment, but safe yeah. to say they made the right decision to can that. <laughs> it's like interesting, but no, thumbs down to that. Um, if they released that and then tacked on the the movement two, which is basically just the the second half of the piano demo demo verbatim until, of course, the new parts that are all the new vocal parts at the end tag, which is still the demo track and Brian underneath underneath yeah. that singing, but like they added layers on top of that, obviously. But yeah, um, no, <laughs> no to that remake track. Yeah, it, it's an interesting part of the process, though to hear it and see how they arrived at the conclusion not to do it, you know? Yeah, no, it definitely is. Um, yeah, so I was looking forward to this, to hearing this version, the Sir Seth Brian Wilson lead with uh, the 2019 mix basically of that. Because again, I interpreted this as, okay, Mark is gonna recreate what the intention was, uh, basically what like plan A was, it didn't yeah. work. And I was really excited to hear this because I said to myself, you know, as much as I love the studio smile sessions version, the one on the the album proper, um, there's also elements that I'm not crazy about. Mainly the fact that they have Carl echoing him like very prominently or filling in certain parts just out of nowhere. And it just never like jive with me just because there's still that little bit of a disconnect between uh, Carl being on there and Brian being on there and like it doesn't really make it it's just it doesn't feel completely natural to me not that I don't like it but like there's always been this dissonance with with me in terms of uh, people there was a poll question actually on um, the Beach Boys talk social media group about uh, which do you prefer the Carl saying ver- sung version of uh, Surf's Up or the Brian lead version and like I like how Carl sings his part better because he's actually like singing it like a actual lead vocal and not like Brian where he really wasn't intending for his lead to ever be an official vocal. But overall, I, I still prefer Brian. I prefer the Smile Sessions version or any version with Brian on it uh, because I can't get over the, the dissonance between hearing Carl sing it and then, oh, halfway through the song, now here's Brian and it's a completely different kind of vibe to it. It just never felt natural to me. It never, never did any, like it would not that it never did anything. I liked that version, obviously very much Carl, the sort of proper version with Carl on lead, but 
you ask me which of my ver which version is the favorite of mine, I'm going to tell you pretty much any version with Brian, except, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm not crazy about this version. I'm obviously not crazy about the the remake, mm. this, for obvious reasons. But I was looking forward to this so much, and when I listened to this the first time, this is one of the tracks I just gravitated to. Like I was like you. I went to, to listen to certain tracks first that I know, knew I wanted to listen to. And then I went back and listened to the entire thing chronologically all the way through a couple of times. And I remember going to this track and I'm like, why does this not hit home for me? Because I'm going to say something I never would in a million years thought I would ever say about Surf's Up. And honestly, it makes me feel like it's blasphemy. I, this shouldn't be coming out of my mouth when I'm about to say, but I was underwhelmed by this and I should never ever be using the word underwhelmed <laughs> to describe yeah. or underwhelming to describe surfs up. That's totally no. And I, I'm trying to figure out why it's been you know really bothering me ever since I listened to this. And I still am not 100% sure why, but I think it's twofold. Um, it is the fact that, again, Brian did not intend this to be a final lead vocal. And I notice also on this version compared to other versions, you know, the Smile Session studio version, this, when he goes up into the higher register of the colonnaded runes domino parts, there is a lot of echo that's in, 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 utilized. And that's all Mark Lynette's doing pretty much. But he was right to do that because... Again, it kicks the, it's, it's just, it's more you, like what we're used to hearing. And he's doing it in a way that is not inauthentic. Like that, he, somebody, like Brian could have done that in the 60s, applied that kind of echo thing through various means. But like, it's kind of missing here. I think it is still there, but it's a lot, it's not quite as high. It's not quite as uh, prominent. And honestly, I listened to this and I'm still not sure exactly what I'm hearing and like, certain parts in terms of like, what is difference here? Why is this, why am I uh, not reacting to this in the same way that I've reacted to pre previous versions that use this exact same vocal lead? And I think part of it is that, the, the fact that if there is that high, that really like strong echo effect on the colonnade to Bruns Domino part, they've either brought it way back down in terms of its intensity or it's not there at all. I, I honestly, like, it, it's hard for me to tell because I'm not looking for this stuff when I'm listening to it like this. Like when I do my backing track piano amalgamations, I'll listen to the backing track of the song if it's available, of course. And I'm picking out the parts. I'm like, that's the point. But for anything else where I'm not doing that, I'm caught up in the totality of the song just like everybody else is. And... I don't know why I'm not like, a, 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 I don't know why I'm not a fan of this. It doesn't make any sense to me in many respects because Carl's really not on it. He might have be like echoing Brian at one point, I think towards the end of the first movement. Yeah. But other than that, he's not really on it. Um, they added, I think they add, and this is another thing. Um, I kind of don't notice it, but I did like check recently and it is there, I believe. But the synth, bass part that wasn't on the smile sessions version because it would have been inauthentic to put a, a synth bass part on a track from 66 and 67 basically but it was on service up 71 they added that synth bass i think it's still there but like that's the thing like this is a recreation attempt of what they were originally trying to do and they failed at and i'm left saying maybe things worked out for the best that they didn't actually succeed here. Yeah. And I just talked a ton. Sorry, I had a lot to say there. Oh, okay, no, I, I was I was taking it in. I mean, I, I really agree with you on that. It's it's an interesting thing to see and listen to on uh, the progression of it, but I don't think it would have been successful had they went gone down that avenue. And so I'm thankful they didn't, but I'm also glad it's on here so we could listen to it. Yeah, and it's such a bizarre thing to say and I, this is the thing, I agree with you. I don't think it would have been, I don't think it would have hit home no. quite as much as what we wound up getting with Carl's lead vocal on it. And 
I, 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 I have mixed a, a lot of mixed thoughts and emotions on that. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. we got what we got, yeah, and what we got's pretty we, good. Yeah, I mean, it's not. Uh, you think about Surf's Up. It's this legendary track. It's one of the best songs ever written. Um, and then we're thinking about it in these terms, where we're like, it's underwhelmed. Or underwhelming excuse me it's it doesn't hit home they yeah. it was a good thing it didn't work out and i i feel that feels wrong to, to think and say almost you know yeah it, no it's but very like wrong it's you're not critiquing the song you're critiquing the specific recording of it and i think that's yeah. about criticism if you were like yeah the song is kind of whatever i'd be like i don't, I don't know if i agree with you scott but no i i'm on your side with this one it's not a not oh yeah, I, that's not my argument at all. I still, you know, yeah. "Surf's Up" is my number one favorite song, and that is never going to change. <laughs> but, and you know, it's one of the best songs ever written, and that's never going to change. But this recording, this version of it, yeah, and it again, it makes sense, but it also doesn't make sense as to why that is. Like we can point yeah. to these aspects that we've been talking about of why that is the, the way that it is why do we feel underwhelmed by it but i don't know it just it shouldn't be like that and i know that goes without saying but yeah yeah um do you have any other ones sorry to steal your thunder no i i mean i think we stuff. covered everything right yeah, uh, there's a couple of other ones though. Uh, Till I Die, the long version with alternate lyrics. Let's talk about that. That was the fa- the much talked about for many, many years, the positive lyric version of Surf's Up, where somebody, it's pretty much agree, like it's, it's Mike. It, it was Mike who did this, but it's like, oh, it's such a downer song. Ryan wrote this in 1969, by the, by, uh, by the way, so. Um, it didn't Will get years later. Yeah, it was written in '69, actually. Really? The, just the music? Just the music, the demo oh, version. Oh, I did not know that. That's really also cool. on this box. It, I, the, pretty sure that's from uh, 1969, actually. That demo is incredible. Yes, that. We'll skip ahead and we'll just talk about that. Yes, it's great. It's um, but yeah, this is that version where like Mike was heard it the first time and he's like, that's such a downer. Can't you make it more positive? So, you know, people have been guessing, what are these lyrics like? What are the positive lyrics like? And now we listen to this and it's like, it's the same song. It's just when Ryan has his uh, verses, it kills my soul. He changes it to, it holds me up. Or so, and stuff like Mr. that. Positivity. Everything else is the same. Pardon? Mr. Positivity. Yeah. But it, it's almost like, so it's, it's amusing and it's, it, I'm sure this is purposeful, but it's like the laziest rewrite ever. Yeah. It's one of the laziest, I don't want to say it's the laziest ever, but it, it really sounds like it was purposefully made extremely lazy <laughs> to, to make it positive. And that may have been Brian's intent to, to some degree. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. Also, the very first time that you hear a lyric that he changed into a positive one, that the sound of his voice, you can hear the beginnings of the 15 big ones, love you era, Brian Wilson voice. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then I, he still goes into his falsetto, just like in that line too, with the, Hey, 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 it's like a very weird, there's that transition that you don't hear a lot listening to recordings of, of Brian from this time, but it's there. And it's really like, it struck me. Go on, you were saying something. It reminds me a lot of the Sherry She Needs Me from Made in California, mm-hmm. where it's the 60s and the 70s vocals like together. And the, the contrast of the two of them is, is jarring, but also like fascinating to me. Obviously, different scenario here where it's like, it's just his voice was changing with the time. But mm-hmm. it's so interesting to hear like that evolution, you know? Yep, definitely. Uh, and the last one I just want to talk about is uh, Wouldn't It Be Nice to Live Again? Mm, yeah. So this was finally released on Made in California in 2013. Love that version. Me too. This version's a bit different. It's got an extended 
uh, jam session at the end, which I like to call uh, somebody somebody said this to me and I, I never have been able to like call it anything else or think of it as anything else. It's what I like to call the Sesame Street style flute noodling <laughs> portion. Yeah. I have a friend of mine who uh, works on Sesame Street and I sent this to him and I was like, does this remind you? I was like, my friend Scott thinks this is the Sesame Street thing. And he was like, no, you're totally right. Yes. So uh, you're up money with that. Yeah, I, 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 so I made it my Instagram story and this is how you know about it, I know. Yeah. I made it my Instagram story, I was like posting certain reactions that I had when I was listening to the set for the first time, the first day it came out. Um, and I'm like, this is an amazing Dennis Wilson song, super emotional. It is one of my favorites, but does anybody else kind of get taken out of the song when the the flute session starts, the flute yeah. section starts, is, starts Gosh, it, it's hard for me to say for some reason. You know what I mean. The flute Tongue section. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, you're listening to this highly emotional Dennis Wilson song. And all of a sudden you're like, that's weird. Yeah. You, why did a, an episode of Sesame Street just start playing <laughs> in the middle of this really emotional Dennis Wilson song? And well, I guess they felt the need to at least give us a new version of it. If like, you know what I mean? Weird. If they're going to put it on the box set, like, they might as well give us a new version. Same thing with Soul Flow Man Sunshine, where it's like, yeah, I like the version from Made in California better, but I'm glad it's a different version. And I'm not just listening to the same thing again, you know? Yeah, agreed. And I think they almost, I think Mark and Alan may have realized they almost can't get away with not putting the extended version of this song on there. Wouldn't it be nice to live again? Because ever since the Made in California version was released, Loads of people online have been like, can we get the extended session? Can we get the extended session? Because it was known that there's like extra parts, like the, the actual song, like the, the fade out was not like the end of the song. There was more to that jam session. I think they so, made the right call though for Made in California. To yes, they definitely the did. Um, and this is great to hear too, you know, flute noodling aside, I, and I still like it. It's just very Sesame Street-esque. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it goes without saying, it's one of my favorite Dennis Wilson songs. It's beautiful. It's, it's, I find it super interesting that wouldn't it be nice is in the title of the song, but mm -hmm. it's not done in like a hokey Mike love way where like, you're just referencing a beach boys song to reference a beach boys song. Like it just takes on a new context of like, it, it's, it's obviously designed to like, to means to reference the original song and then also like be its own thing and have its own context. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a great, it's just a great song. I wish I made it on the surfs up. It's, it's like a tragedy that it didn't get on that album. Yep. Um, Ed Roach actually commented on this or has commented on this uh, in the past, but Dennis was the kind of composer and this makes perfect sense where when he wrote something uh, and either it got released or it didn't generally like, moved on to the next thing yeah like, okay you released pacific ocean blue done on to the next thing yeah um, which is interesting because he is a fan of certain chords i've mentioned this before like all the wilson brothers were so like you hear echoes of certain songs and certain other ones of his which when we get to just five we'll talk about some of that stuff um but that's interesting because like he does borrow ideas from previous songs he writes or wrote really um previous song he wrote why can't I speak? Previous songs he wrote. There we go. Um, but yeah, just it is a tragedy. It should have been on there. There's nothing else to really say. Yeah. What else do we have for disc four? Uh, we have the acapella versions of some of the songs, not all of the songs. Don't go the near the water. Great. Oh, the I'm so glad they put the A Day in the Life of a Tree one out. Yep. That one is, uh, I, I think, is it, do you know if it's true that Dennis actually did a version of that song and like the tape doesn't exist or something? I had heard that somewhere. Um, I had not heard that. No, not before. I mean, sang. Brian, Brian did a version and it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore because Brian was basically, it was kind of a ruse by Brian to just get Jack Riley to sing it. Yeah. 
So I would be fascinated to hear. I I I don't remember where I heard it. Now it must have been on Smiley Smile or something, or maybe the Beach Boys read it, where someone was like, apparently Dennis did a took a stab at it, but it wouldn't surprise me. That would have been cool to hear. His voice is more suited to a song like this than Brian's is. Absolutely. Well, there was there was one interview that Mark Lynette and Alan Boyd did recently. It wasn't Beach Boys Talk, although they might have mentioned it in Beach Boys Talk as well, where they ask they ask Alan Boyd about the Manson tapes from '69. Oh, I and they literally they literally were like, "You don't oh, have to man. answer this if you don't want to answer this." And he was like, yep. "I'm not going to." And I was like, "All right." I well, know the exact interview you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I probably I can't even think of who it was either. It was like a it was a video inter- interview. That much yeah, it was, it was a really good one. I can look it up really quick. It was a really good interview. It was. I loved um, like hearing Alan talk about all this stuff. But yeah, I remember that I moment. Say, like at least no, problem. it's out there. Like they're yeah. not stupid. We know they know what we know, and we know what they know. You know what I mean? Like yeah. But they're they're also super super professional about that stuff. So I understand them not wanting to talk about that, but. Yeah. That is the one thing I think me and one of my friends have always said, like, if we were ever to go to the Beach Boys vaults and they were like, go, just go listen to whatever you want. What would be the three things? And like, for me, it's I want I don't even know if they would have it, but I would want to listen to the master tapes for River Song because I'm fascinated by all the vocal parts in the chorus of River Song. I'd listen to that. I'd listen to the outtakes from the reunion album because I want to know what else they tried and didn't finish. And then I would listen to the Manson tapes because I know they exist. And I'm so curious. What if they're like amazing? You know what I mean? Like, what if they're good? We'll never know. We'll never know. There ain't no copyright session box set coming out for that. Unless someone bootlegs it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, be the change you want to see in the world, I guess, you know, human priorities. (laughs) So, yeah true um honestly like the the acapella stuff i don't really, really have much to say because we know like all this stuff is great as acapella i like the the moment at the end of the acapella long promised road where you hear brian and carl kind of goofing off at the end of the recording oh yeah yeah that's that's cute i like that a yeah. lot um but other than that like i have nothing insightful to say about this stuff i love it all of it that's it that's all i have to say there's nothing much to say the i just wanted to say that interview it's from uh this guy darren paltrowitz from the paltrow cast okay Uh, and it was an interview he did with mark and alan it was really good Mm -hmm. okay cool um yeah i'd be curious actually to watch that again so if you have like a link yeah, I'll send it. Share, to you. share with me after after we're done here. But yes, be interested in listening to that again. All right, so we're towards the end of this for now. The bonus tracks. We kind of well, actually, I don't want to. I don't. The the first track here is um, "I Just Got My Pay." Great song. Great song. Uh, and I have nothing to add. Yeah, I I, just, I, do, I like the middle section where it's like the. It's its own thing. Yeah, it's it kind of changes. It shifts a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I think that song is so interesting to me because it's really, I always say, why didn't the Beach Boys go back into their catalog and try and recycle stuff? And it's like, well, this is them doing that. And it's successful. It's really good. You know? Mm-hmm. I, w- I wish they would have put, and it's another one. They could have put it out and it probably wouldn't have been a hit, but it would have been, we would have talked about it, you know. I don't know. It's just a good song. It's just a good tune. Yep. I don't have much to add to that. I like it. Yeah. I like it. It's also the lyrics are kind of silly. Oh, They're yeah. not like silly, silly. Just like he's just talking about like how he can. I could save my money and get interest rates and blah blah blah, or I could just go out and spend it. And it's like, yeah. cool, man. All cool. right. <laughs> But the, it's such a groove that you kind of don't even care. You're just like, all right, sing about whatever. Like, I'm just enjoying the song. Yep. You know? But Yeah, no, I, it, same way. It's like, oh, this is interesting. When it, I think it's Mike a testament gets, to the song, you know? Yeah, when Mike gets the end parts of, uh, it's it's the chorus, I think. I just got my pay, where he goes into that low register. Yeah. That hits home. Like that, I'm like, yes. Oh, so good. Um, 
walk in. I don't know why. Well, actually, I do know why. This song, when I heard it on here, it reminded me a little bit of Jan and Dean, but not necessarily stylistically, just because there's a little, there's a reference to a little old lady. <laughs> That's the yeah. only part of this song that kind of sticks out in my brain, honestly. And it's just because of that moment. There, a song. It was just not a, a huge earworm for me. I am going to disagree with you on that. I actually, there's, this is one of those songs that like, there are certain Beach Boy bootleg songs that I'll just listen to when I'm doing work on YouTube. Like I'll just put songs on. This is one of my go-tos. Or, well, not anymore. I guess I can listen to it on Spotify. But it's one of my go-tos because it's so, it, it feels like, it was never intended to be released. They were just doing this for a laugh. And like, there's the whole line about where whoever stole the car is in the in the right lane. And, and like the way he sings it, he's like disappointed by like, this great car is in the right lane. Like it's it's funny and it's silly and it it doesn't mean anything or it's not trying to say anything. It's just a fun little song and I'm glad they put it out. It's a good one. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not arguing it's a bad song. It just, for me, yeah, it's like it's there. It's not one of the more memorable ones for me. Um, we're gonna skip talking about when girls get together because we already talked about it. <laughs> talking about baby. it once is enough. <laughs> baby, baby. So this is the very first track, chronologically speaking, in terms of like the order of its presentation on here. That kind of chronological. Yeah, it's from. Dennis Wilson's abandoned solo album project from the early 70s. So for anybody watching this who may not know, um, Dennis actually planned on making a solo album back around like 1971, like that was his intent. And then uh, that didn't happen. And like, you know, in 77, he finally puts out Pacific Ocean Blue and that's his first uh, album, but that wasn't supposed to be his first solo album. Wasn't it going to be called like, it's, it's it's Hubba, Hubba Hubba, which gosh, that sounds, I feel ridiculous saying that out loud, but this is that, you know, and that, that title started out as like probably a joke. So. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he knew what he was doing with that one. He was just right. messing around, man. Yep. You know. But what did you think of this song? It's an interesting one. Um, it's silly. It's another. It's another. Just like they're goofing off. He's doing the baby, baby, like that voice. You know, mm -hmm. it's just. I I en I enjoyed it because they were having fun with it, and I was like, I'm I'm having fun watching them have or listening to them have fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Same. I uh, same here. I like like the music itself. It's got a really good groove to it. So like okay. I get into the song uh, when I'm listening to it. Like it it makes me like pay attention. It's not like some of the other songs on here where like, I like it, but like, it doesn't stick at all in my brain. This one sticks in my brain in a good way. So it's a good thing. <laughs> and it's, it's just not, it's like you said, you're, it's not, they're, they're not being super serious. It's kind of a goofy song. Yeah. As you said. Um, Awake. Okay. This song, Awake. Brian's vocal. This song gets stuck in my head, and, I'm, and I, I love that it does, because it's it's an amazing vocal, and it's just you're hearing Brian go up into the upper register, which is rare by this point. I mean, he still does it on certain tracks, of course, but like this kind of ultra sweet song where he goes into that register, it just it's it is it's fantastic. Amazing. I don't know how else to describe it. What do you I think? never knew a demo of this existed too. And I'm so glad it does um, because that's one of my favorite of like the spring songs, which again is why we need a spring archival release of some kind. But those songs, you know, the version that's on that album is fantastic. And I think it really fits Marilyn Wilson's voice. Personally, I think it fits better, but hearing Brian do it with his falsetto is so cool. Like it's just you can't help but like smile and just be like, yep. Nice. You know? Yeah. And then we have an, a really interesting track. This is the last track on disc four. It's a new day. So some background here. It's a new day. I believe is another poops hubba hubba song. Um, which again, yeah. <laughs> Every time you say it, it's be laughing at that, but 
I think it is actually this song that, uh, that I'm thinking because yeah. it's a uh, Dennis Wilson and uh, Daryl Dragon and Stanley Shapiro co-write. But aside from like two of Dennis's most well-known uh, co-writers on this track having written this particular song, this is Blondie Chaplin on lead. Yeah. So this might be the first um, recording where he has a lead vocal that's Beach Boys related. Obviously he was in the flame as well. Um, I wonder why that was the one and who chose him? Did Dennis say, Blonde, do you sing this? It's a good question. I can only presume that, yeah, it must have been. Yeah. How else would, have, would it have happened? He's, Blondie is a backing vocalist at this point, a backing musician. Yeah. Maybe, who knows, maybe Dennis wasn't there and Carl's like, yeah, just do it, you know? Well, actually, it's interesting. It's, this track is listed as, uh, has a, uh, Dennis listed as the producer for it. But, but oh, it okay. So then, yeah, it was but definitely. Sometimes yeah. producer credits are not pr- like quite accurate. You kind of fudge things sometimes, yeah. or there's ghost producers. But um, I'm sure, I, I guess he probably could have very well done this one. Yes, produced it. There's nothing that he couldn't have done. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. It, it had to have been him producing yeah. it and having something to do with Blondie seeing the lead. Shout out to Blondie. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking about what you said before. <laughs> um, your plans to, to try and meet Blondie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, We're gonna, it's gonna happen. No, it's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Because I want to, you're willing, you'll tell me all about it, and I love every second of hearing you. I gotta, I gotta ask him some stuff about the flame, and I gotta ask him some stuff about he, because he has two solo records, one from the '70s, which is really, really good, and then one from like 2006 that I've never heard because it's like 200 bucks for a CD copy of it online, and I want (laughs) to listen to it. So if anyone has it, let me know because I I just want to hear it. It's not on Spotify, but I want to be. Yeah, ditto, ditto what you just said. I also yeah. <laughs> no. If if I find it, I'm gonna send it to you. Don't worry. Okay, appreciate um, that. Because I, it's the one. I think I had said this earlier. Me and my one of my best friends, we listened to everything in chronological order, and that was the only thing we couldn't listen to. Because mm-hmm. I, I don't have it. <laughs> you know, it drove me crazy. Yeah, but I gotta be like, all right. I know you got some some CDs back at your house. Like, just send me one or something. You know. We're gonna me and Blondie are gonna become friends. What the Blondie Chaplin? Yeah, just send me one. Just send me one. What's he gonna say? No. I mean, yes, that's what's probably gonna happen. Doesn't feel like absolutely not. Well, I I told you I wrote Al a letter. I wrote him a postcard, and he never wrote me back. Yeah, I mean, Al's a busy guy though. So, but it, this was like peak pandemic. He had nothing going on. He could answer. <laughs> No, well, I think I really think it was my handwriting. My handwriting sucks. <laughs> I think it was definitely that. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to somebody with atrocious handwriting himself as well. So I know what that's like. I still love you, Al. It's all right. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> moving on to the final disc of the CD set, disc number five. Many people say that this is like the highlight of the set, this fifth, fifth disc. It is. So. And it's not on the vinyl edition either, which cool. Cool explanation. Cool. Like, well, quotation marks. We got, we got Surf's Up and Sunflower. That's two whole sides. We could have, whatever. I've said my piece on that. I've I spoken my piece on that. I was doing this and then I meant like, <laughs> yeah. Like, what? The, what? How, did that, how did that get screwed up in my brain? Um, um, first track. This was another one released prior to the official release of the whole set. The alternate This Whole World with that really syrupy, you know, syrupy is a good alternate word. ending, which I don't like at all. You don't like it. I don't, so I've noticed this. I've, I've you know, read comments online from different people reacting to this when this dropped. This is very much neither you love the changes here or you really strongly don't. I fall into I fall into that latter, latter uh, category overall. I don't like it. To me, it, it, it this is like no offense 
uh, intended here. I'm not saying this is like a means to hate on Bruce, but this strikes me as like something Bruce would do. I'm telling him you said that. <laughs> Bruce could be watching this. So like, I, I mean, no disrespect, but like the really like this just struck me as like his style. Yeah. I, I don't like it in this instance. There's a plenty of other stuff he, he's done. I love. But if he is the, if by chance I could be wrong, you know, obviously I don't know who did this, who was responsible, whose idea was this, but whoever's idea this was, they made the right decision to yeah. not go with this. I, like I said, I really like just seeing the process, the creative process and seeing like they tried this out. Maybe yep. it wasn't successful, but they at least tried it. So I can appreciate it from that perspective. Um, but the one that's on the album is is just perfect. It's perfect as is, yeah. So add some music to your day, the alternate version. So you already talked about this, really. Yeah. And this is one that has been bootlegged before. Um, it's on one of the get to boot or not get to boot, get the boot, excuse me. Uh, yeah. bootleg CDs that exist. And they've been out for quite a while now. Um, so if you heard that song through that album, you know, this is nothing new. Um, but I've always liked the alternate lyrics. Like they're to me, they're neither better nor worse. They're just different. Yeah. I had never heard this before. I didn't know it was bootlegged. So oh, okay. this was kind of a shock to me to hear. Um, because it was one of those instances, I think it was in like the shower or something. I didn't know what was going on next. So I'm like, oh, add some music to your day. Great song. And then comes out of nowhere. I, I think I've said enough about this, but it's, it's just, it's cool, man. I dig it. Yep. You also got to wonder, why wasn't this released in any capacity earlier? Like a yeah, bonus I mean, track. Put it as a bonus track or something to some, or something like that. When they do the, maybe they uh, just... the reissues or something. Yeah. No, that's a good Why point. Why is this sitting in a vault somewhere? <laughs> this is the first official release of it. This version, I believe, yeah. 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 I never knew that. Well, I didn't know it existed a couple weeks ago, so... <laughs> yeah. That's a good point, though. I, you wonder why. Yeah, I mean, it's not like... I, I don't... I, I, it just... I don't know. It's, it's not like there's any harm in it, so... Yeah. Um, this would have just been a cool little bonus track somewhere if they wanted to put it out there. Here. Okay, next track, the alternate version of Don't Go Near the Water. Let me start off by saying those snippets, the 1970 release snippets from late 2020, I heard the snippet of this version of Don't Go Near the Water where uh, Al goes into that extremely low register and he's singing very different lyrics from what wound up on the actual track in the end. And I was like, holy crap, I love this. Not just because his vocal is doing something different, but because the lyrics are more interesting. It's like, yeah. saw a rat uh, lying or dying near a water hole. Dad must have known then right away that's no place for a man to go. Like, that's that's a, a significant step up in terms of lyrics from what we wound up getting. But it then feels it very comes folky. out. Pardon? It feels very folky. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, that's exactly right. And then this, the set comes out and I listen to this and I'm like, that's the only part of this song I actually like, this version of it. It's the only part of this version I like. The rest of it I don't like. And I think the rest of the track that, of what we got is better compared to this. I yeah I agree. Um, I don't really have that strong of an opinion on this one to be honest with you. Yeah, just kind of exists and also, toothpaste and soap can make our oceans a bubble bath. Also, there's no vocals on the end tag. Like, yeah, what? that was that threw me off. Um, who knows? Maybe they just didn't get around to doing it. I'm sure there must have been a reason in that, you know, this is probably how the track was left in that state. Yeah. And they didn't want to mess with it for this box set. They didn't want to re-add it because they didn't want to just like just mess with it, like I just said. Yeah. Um, 
but that that also like was like oh there's no tag vocals on this well so much for my thought that i would have i would largely prefer this version to the album version i prefer that the tag at the end of that song is that bruce is doing because that also feels like a bruce thing i think it's multiple beach boys not just bruce just like the arrangement of it you know what i mean it has that feel to it yeah it does yes um and just in terms of sound but I, I think it's not just bruce on there i think it's uh more than him but yeah well that and like the other interesting fact which a lot of people know about the Entag is that the the harmony arrangements those were actually daryl dragon's doing like, that's all him oh know. that's that's what i meant i thought i thought what i was saying was i thought bruce had done the arrangement of the vocals at the end Oh, oh, you know, okay. Sorry, I didn't that. but it, no, it's actually it's confirmed by people who would know this stuff. Meaning, yeah, yeah, uh, actual like people who work on it or band historians that this is actually Daryl Dragon's contribution to this cool. stuff. The, arra- the arrangement of the end tag vocals. It's a great tag. Mm-hmm. Agreed, and the fact that it's not here it drives yeah. me crazy. Um. So this is the remake of Surfs Up. We already talked about this, so I'll yeah. skip. We'll, we'll skip talking about this. Soulful Old Man Sunshine. So you mentioned this before. You prefer the Made in California version. I actually prefer this version, not by like a huge amount, but I yeah. slightly prefer this version. But you can't go wrong with either version, unless you're, unless you're Carl Wilson and you're really upset about singing Sun Sun Sunshine or sun, whatever the. Uh, That's why I like the Made in California one, though. Believe it or not, because oh, really? when he sings "Sunshine," I just it chuckles. Yeah, it gets me, it gives me a little laugh. I honestly don't even notice it when it plays. Like when I've played the, it's so quick. It's so it's quick, not, and you got to point it's out it's not on the the this version though at all for this set. Yeah, no, that was the other thing that struck me. It's like, did they remove that? It, Apparently, it it's have. a different take or something. Mark, Lin- somebody asked Mark Lynette on one of those endless harmony Q and A's, and he said it was a different take. It was from a different uh, sixteen okay. tape. Okay, so that explains it then. I always thought though that the reason they never put that song out was because Carl's <laughs> Sunshine. He says that, and I thought they were they just never went back to it. Or so, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, it must have been an earlier take. I take it that Mark was talking about. It was an earlier take where he yeah. did make that mistake, but not a take that Carl was like, this is a final, we're going to go with this take. Yeah. It must have been like that, you know? That, that has to have been... See, I'm a fan of, like, little flubs on songs like that. Like, there's always... Um, like, there's a lot of early Beatles songs where they, like, double up on vocals and, like, one of them will get the lyric wrong or something. Uh, I'm, try- I'm trying to think of a song. Um... Do you know I'll Get You? It's It was just a single. Mm-hmm. You know that song? There's yep. a part where uh, you're going to take your time, you're going to change your mind, and George sings the wrong lyric for like the first half of the line, and then he like... It just it just adds something cute to the song, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or like in, in the mono version of 409, I think. Yeah, when one of Mike's vocals, the double vocals, comes in earlier than the other one with the now the 413, and it's kind of an echo, like just stuff like that, where it's like it's flubs that add character to the song, you know? Right. Well, it's like the cough on Wendy to, to throw another it, beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they talking during here today or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. There's just stuff in there that, like, it just makes the song a little more human, and I appreciate it. Yep. I agree with you and like it it bothers me that this was never released it's like why is this not released until like you know that's one of those songs that i show people when because i i try not to bring up the beach boys in conversation too much because i don't because you go on and on and on and try people i would just i just would take up the whole conversation and i just yeah so, but when they do come up and people know I like them, they're like, oh, you know, they're just a surfing band. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, listen to this. Listen to Soulful Old Man Sunshine. Listen to, you know, that's one of those I, I always am like, this is going to change your mind about the Beach Boys. Yeah, it's, 
it is exactly that. And it's, it's one of those types of songs. But there's so many of those types of songs where you just like say, listen to this. Yeah. You're, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna like this and it's gonna change your perceptions. Um, it really should have been released in its time. I, it's a very sad, yeah. not very sad, but it's like, it's really unfortunate that it just never got released. Sad is kind of a strong word for a non-release, but it's unfortunate. Um, hearing it now, though, and that's the good thing. Yeah, the alternate mix of "I'm Going Your Way." You you mentioned this a little bit before, but this is the one from the EP, right? Yeah, it's such a good rocker. Mm-hmm. I love this track, um, and I every time I I just read the novelization of Quentin Tarantino's "Once a Time Once Upon a Time in Hollywood." Uh, which I don't know if you saw that movie. Uh, it's really, really good. Um, but there's a there's a scene because there's a whole subplot in the movie where Brad Pitt's character like meets some of the Manson girls and befriends one of them. And there's a specific scene where I'm like, this song would have fit perfectly in the movie had they used it. Um, and I don't know, it's just cool. It's just a great song. And yeah, well, I mean. Isn't this kind of a reference or was written as kind of a reference to how Dennis initially got caught up in the Manson situation? With yeah, I think he I wrote think it about, he was, he the was, hitchhikers. yeah, the hitchhikers. yeah, because Brad Pitt's character in that movie definitely takes a lot of influence from Dennis Wilson, like for sure. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it definitely is about that, like. <laughs> without a doubt it's just it's regardless of the historical context it's just a good rocker and it gets stuck in your head and then there's that little part at the the bridge that's like really mellow it reminds me it 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 does what keeping the summer alive wants to do more effectively where you have the rocking part and then there's the lay down in the sun like that mellow part in that song yep i think this does that better with the ooh, I want to tell you. Is it? It's so good. It's just a good song. Dennis Wilson's a great songwriter. What else do you want me to say? Yeah, just a good song. What else do you say? <laughs> yeah. Really, it's summed up in just what you said right now. Next track is one that was released before, again, on Made in California. Where is she? And again, this is one of those songs where if it wasn't, like, because I heard it first on Made in California, I loved it on there. It was like um, another one of his moments where I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Mind blowingly awesome stuff. And it's still great, but it doesn't have that same impact because, again, it's been released before. I don't know what else it's to say about it. It's a beautiful song, though. It's a beautiful it's really song. Incredible. Beautiful, Brian vocal. Yeah. yeah. And I love the the dual vocal, the like, I wonder if she's. And then, like, they kind of come together to harmonize, and oh, it's just. It's a really good song. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have probably the silliest, arguably the silliest song on here and kind of the most throwaway e ish which is Carnival Over the Waves. <laughs> la, 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 da, da. Yeah. Like, why, what, why are you doing this? I, <laughs> I would love to know that, uh, well, actually, now that I say that, that aloud, I, the, the liner notes actually might have a, a line about that where they talk about like what that like why they worked on that like why was that a thing um i think i'm, I'm going off of memory here but um it exists <laughs> that's all it's it's, it's there yeah, I mean, it's cool and it it's like it's not something i listen to constantly but when it's on i enjoy it you know yeah um, you know, I there are songs that are inherently goofy that the band has done that I love. I mean, Peter Totter Love, uh, Sailplane, Loopy Loop Flip Flop. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Like, I love that actually. I really love that. Um, this doesn't, uh, it doesn't land the same way this track for me as the other tracks I just mentioned. Yeah. It's like, I almost think, is this like a vocal exercise that they're doing? Are they just doing this to warm up their voices and they have yeah. the tape recorder going? I don't know. I, it's just kind that's of a good theory and that's probably what it, what it is. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. there's no song here. 
it's literally just the vocals. Yeah. So uh, it would have been maybe it would have made like a cool like twenty second interlude in between tracks or something. You know what I mean? If it was just a quick fade in, fade out. Get your yeah. If it was used on an album that like is reveling in in that kind of humor and ridiculousness. Yeah. Can you imagine if this was like an interlude like you're describing on Sunflower? I don't think it would land very well, actually. Yeah. Or, or, or God forbid, surfs up. Hell no. Might have fit more than uh, in student demonstration time, though. You would have a point with that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see to that point, yes. Um, okay, next track is It's Natural. This is a song by, um, I almost said, I was about to say Adam Sandler. No, it's, I believe it's David Sandler, I think. Um, Adam Sandler's dad, David Sandler. Maybe, I, I don't know the, the chronology, yeah. like the, the lineage there, who, who Adam Sandler's father is. Um, somehow I doubt it's David Sandler though, but <laughs> maybe. Um, you can't prove me wrong though. Right. I was actually listening to this earlier today, this track. Uh, it's Mike on lead vocals. Honestly, I don't know. Like, this is another song. It's nice, it's pleasant. It doesn't stick in my brain or stand out as memorable for me. Yeah, this one's fine. I'm not really... Yeah. Uh, this is one where, like, like, okay, this can... This I can... I understand why this sat in a vault for half a century. <laughs> So it's one of the only tracks on here where I'm like, um, no it. big loss if that stayed in the vault. No disrespect to anybody who worked on it. And was sorry, Adam it, Sandler's but... dad. Pardon? I said sorry to Adam Sandler's dad. <laughs> yes. But... Then we get into this suite of songs, basically, like you know, basically this subsection of the disc that is all. Poops, hubba hubba songs and recordings. So we have the medley of All of My Love slash Ecology. We have Before, Behold the Night. Um, we have uh, Old Movie, which became Cuddle Up. Uh, Cuddle Up. Uh, we have Hawaiian Dream. And we have an early session of Sound of Free. And then I've Got a Friend. A lot of these are unfinished like a lot of them have no vocals they probably would have had vocals had they been finished i don't think anything on here most likely was intended as an instrumental um sorry i'm getting a little congested as well very good you know what i would love to hear is you know how they did how taylor hawkins from the foo fighters did the vocals on holy man mm -hmm. i would love for someone because there's a live version of um of i've got a friend that exists where Dennis sings the song. So the lyrics and the melody, like these all, like, they, exist. they exist. Someone should, should record a vocal part for it just to do it. There's actually quite a bit of, of songs in the Beach Boys discography that weren't fully finished in their time that I would say probably would benefit from that too. Not just the ones yeah. we're talking about, but it's like while it's possible to do this, they, I think they should at least give it a, a try. Yeah, so I think it'd be out. cool. They they did that a couple of years ago with it was like Elvis Costello, one of the guys from Mumford and Sons, a bunch of like celebrities just found a bunch of old like Bob Dylan lyrics and were like, let's just make songs out of these. And it was really, really cool. And I think that you want to get you know, you know, want to keep the Beach Boys sort of a mainstream, keep them relevant, have something like that where you take unfinished songs get some really, you know, some talented people that respect, have Darian Sahanaja produce it or something. Someone that's like really respectful of the material and knows the stuff and like get people in there that would add their, you know, that would contribute something interesting to it. Um, yeah. I agree. I, if I ever, if I ever get famous, I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do about that. Yes. And we'll, we'll all thank you for that when that happens. Yeah, for real. We will. All of my, uh, all of my love. Also, is that's the other song that has the river song kind of thing in it, right? Yeah, you can hear like the origins of river song within it. I could not get the run, run, river, run. Couldn't get that out of my head for probably about two days. It's so good, 
And it blows my mind that all this stuff, even if it's unfinished, like how did none of this come out yet? Like what other dentist stuff is in these vaults? I want to hear them. I want to hear, they got, they should really do a comp of just all dentist stuff. Cause it would, it would be really amazing. Yeah, no, I agree. Nothing much to add about your sentiments there. And the only other thing I'll add really is in my opinion, one of the best tracks on this entire set I think probably my favorite track of the the dentist material on here that was previously unreleased is Behold the Night. Yeah. That is so gorgeous. Uh, it's like I said, I, I I know you heard me or read this on when I posted my reaction to this on Instagram, but it has a very wonderful esque vibe to it. The smile version sure. of wonderful. Same kind of vibe. The smiley smile version, yeah. Well, not the you you think it's the smiley smile version? I actually think. No, I was saying I was saying not the smiley oh, smile. Yeah, yeah, no. Smiley. That smile. one gives me the creeps, man. No, um, I I don't feel like I, I I don't listen to the track and then feel like I have to go take a shower, <laughs> like I do with the smiley smile. Fair enough. Yeah. You'll feel unclean after watch after listening to that. Um, there's so much we can, we could say about this stuff, but honestly, there's arguably too much we could say about this stuff. It's just um, really incredible that Dennis was pumping these things out. And, and I know there's a lot of songs where he would just write them and play them live once. And I mean, it's just remarkable the, the amount of raw talent he just had pouring out of him in this period. And it's so fascinating to like, see the evolution of that through something like this like an archival release it's really incredible and i'm so i'm so glad that these tracks are on there because they're just absolutely amazing yep agree what else do we have are we, we have uh the till i die piano demo we kind of already talked about it that as well yeah. you know we don't need, need to say anymore it was amazing great you know, yeah almost fabled there's this almost like mythical track. It felt it felt like the "Till I Die" piano demo, and here it is yeah. finally. Um, we have after that some back home track. Oh, the demo of "Back Home" is so freaking good. Mm -hmm. It's it feels like a totally different song though. Like it's kind of crazy. Yep, I, I love. I agree. It. Um, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, I loved hearing that. I love this song in general. And we, we talked about this song earlier in uh, our stream. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But it was, uh, like, it, I think where we differed was, I think we both agreed we don't really like the 76, 15 Big Ones version. No. We both like the versions that came before that one. But which one is our favorite differed? You like the original from 63 best. I actually like the the version, the alternate version that came out on Made in California, which this is that version for, for the, the track immediately after the demo. That's yeah. that version, but it's a different arrangement and structure almost. I got to be honest with you. I might, I have to listen to it more, but the demo version might be my, be from favorite. this box set might be my favorite over the original, but the original 63 one's also so good. Yeah. But... I love I love songs like this or like Sherry She Needs Me that have like this evolution over time that like what how they started off or like I'm trying to think of another song that does or um one after nine oh nine by the Beatles where it like it starts off in one period of the band and then it just kind of like gets brought back and it sounds similar but different. It's like I love the evolution of songs like that and it's really cool to be able to piece all of it together now chronologically. Yep. I know I'm saying that a lot. It's like, I, what else? No, I feel, that, man. I feel that. You're spot on. Yeah. <laughs> um, after that, we have uh, Won't You Tell Me. And it, so it's the demo and then the actual Such song. Such a great itself. song. Such a great song. That's another one that I, it's weird hearing it in good quality because I've known the bootleg of it for so long <laughs> that it's like, it's kind of jarring to hear in like such high fidelity, but. It's a great song. The Sunrays version of it is fantastic too. Um, it's just a really good song. 
it also goes to show that Murray Wilson is a good song. Like he's capable of writing good songs, you know. And there's a yeah, sweet moment not, on it. Caveat there, not consistently, but he could not consistently. But when he's working with when he's working with Brian, he can write good song, you know. Yeah. Um, and there's a part in the in either the demo or the actual version where Brian's talking to, to Murray and he's like, What'd you think, Dad? And he's like, It's really good. And I was like, Oh, like it just like hit me in a weird way. I was like, damn, man, like I don't know. Yeah. Well, this is the demo, I think, is the, the one I'm thinking of with what I'm about to say. The demo version on here, you hear the the back and forth between Brian and Murray, and yeah, and Brian is like laughing maniacally at points because I don't know, he's just how he has to react, I guess, at that point, considering his history with his father and vice yeah. versa. It's a very weird moment that was captured. It's, yeah, man, it's it's hard to listen to because you know the history, but it's like, I don't know, I find it sweet that, like, regardless of all the, the stuff that happened with them, they're still able to make music together. And, like, yeah, Brian's, like, still constantly seeking his approval, but, like, I don't know. It's just nice to, like, see them get along, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I agree. I just wish they got along a bit better and more genuinely. I mean, Murray, True. Murray no, with that sure. jab, this is the best song you've written in, what, what do you say, like, four years, five years, three years, <laughs> something like that? Like... He can't help himself. Yep. Um, and then we have Barbara which actually this was also supposed to be a Poops Hubba Hubba track. Got released later. Um, did he, did Dennis release this as a solo? Was this the track that he wrote solo or not? Not really. No, I don't think he ever put this one out. Oh. I could be wrong, but I don't, I don't remember hearing it. It's you not might a- be right, actually. I might be misremembering and thinking of one of the other singles uh, that came out in like 71, like Sound of Free or, or um, yeah, something like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, to me, I almost never think of Barbara as being unreleased because it was released on the Endless Harmony documentary soundtrack in 1998. So for most of my life, it's been released. So like, yeah. I, I just don't think of it like that. It's a nice song. What I, song I am I thinking of? It was going to be on Made in California it's a Brian song. It has a, there's a, it's a woman's name. Oh man. There was a, it's, I remember reading, there was a list of songs that Mark and Alan said they proposed to put on the box set. My solution was one of them. Carry me home was one of them. Uh, I don't remember it now. It was a song that Brian Wilson wrote. I think it was in the eighties and it was about a woman and he was like too embarrassed to put it out. Hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about at all? Am I crazy? Am I making this up? I'm not sure what you're talking about unless there is a song, although I've always, like, I've never really looked into this matter, but from reading up about it in the little bits that I have, I've always interpreted this as like a 15 Big Ones Love You era kind of track. But there was, there has been some talk of a, of a song that Brian wrote. It's like just, high, like, I guess the subject matter would not be appropriate for a release. Like if it were to be released, it'd be very controversial. Was it Lazy Lizzie you're thinking? You're yeah, thinking? that's the one. Oh, so that, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That about. song is weird. Yeah, that, um, that's not what you're thinking of though, right? No. Yeah, I don't um, know. I, I, it's, I, about, I, it's about um, Stevie Nicks. You wrote a song about Stevie Nicks. That's oh, what Stevie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That, I my brain confused them because they're songs with women's names in the title. Understandable. It's Barbara, Stevie, Barbara, Stevie. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Barbara's a good track. Uh, We should, I don't know. You want to move on? Yeah. We're We're almost done. We're almost at the end. We're almost at the end. Uh, Early, uh, early version of slip on through. We talked about that one. That we talked about that one. On the EP, another one that was on really the, great. the 19 EP, right? Yeah, yeah this, is, this is one of them. Um, session highlights of Susie Cincinnati. Do we really need to talk about that? It's no, cool to hear. we don't need to talk about that. Um, I don't, brief, we need to talk about my solution either. I mean, 
it's cool the instrumental it's cool you well, know we talked about that already. we we yeah. did talk in depth i think about my solution a little bit well not like in in depth you know what i mean by that but like yeah we, we spent some time talking about that um but yeah that's this is where it is on the the album yeah. um that track and backing vocals version of my solution then we get that lyricless snippet of you never give me your money this is another track that people have talked about in the hardcore fan community of the beach boys for years now it's released it's just a snippet basically it's funny that it exists i it's bruce playing that right it's just him messing around yeah he's yeah (laughs) i'm i'm glad they put it out there and i remember mark Lynette saying like we just put this out there not because we felt it like needed to be released but like fans wanted it and like it's short why not and I agree with him why not it's cute I'm glad it exists and I'm glad it's on here yep so then we're in the final three tracks first one is the medley of happy birthday to Brian on Brian's birthday and uh Bruce singing a very silly version of God Only Knows which I actually like this recording a lot, like all of it. Yeah, that echo on his voice is like, inc- has this been bootlegged? Do you know? I don't think it has. No. I, I want to. Apparently, there are other songs they recorded that night, from whatever night that was. I assume it was 1970. So it would have been June 20th, 1970. Yeah, that's Brian's birthday. I want to hear whatever the I. It reminded me a lot of Beach Boys Party in the sense of everyone's kind of talking and there's music being played and they're like messing around and like, it's just cool, man. It's just a great, I'm glad they they put that on there. Yeah. Also, you're talking about Bruce who's doing the lead vocals here. I, and we're talking about Brian's birthday. They're literally seven days apart. Uh, Brian's is uh, June 20th and Bruce's birthday is June 27th. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but I like this. I mean, the silly, the silly version of God Only Knows, like it works. <laughs> it actually works. Yeah, it's it's just like I I love it. Rem- that part reminds me a lot of Smiley Smile in the sense of like they're almost like killing their darlings of like they're doing something weird with this track and and they're having fun with it. And then there's the part. Don't they also? No, there's it's not this track. There's one track where you hear. Um, somebody talk about like Little Deuce Coop or something. They kind of, I yeah. don't know, forget no, what I'm I know saying. What you're they, talking about. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. is that a party outtake you're, you're thinking of from? 65? No, it's, there, there's something on this, it's on this box set. I, okay, so if it is, yeah, I think actually there is a rep, there, I think it is this track that has that reference. Is it? it? Yeah. I think so. I just occurs. I find it interesting bands talking about their own songs because you kind of forget sometimes like oh yeah they they have to play this like every night like they essentially live with these songs like I don't know just think it's cool yep no, I agree um and then last two potential previews for what's to come next we have the track and backing vocals to you need a mess of help to stand alone and an acapella version, an amazing one, by the way, of Marcella. Can I be honest with you? I think that this acapella version of Marcella might be like, if not my favorite, one of my favorite things on this box set. <laughs> I well, yeah, it. I mean. Because it, it came out of nowhere. I was like, why, first of all, why is this on here? I'm not complaining, but why is this on here? And like, oh, it's just so good. And there's like little parts that I didn't, this is everything you would want from an acapella version of a song where you're like, you're picking up on things you didn't recognize before. And oh, it's fantastic. Yep. Um, I mean, this track is right up there with the all I want to do acapella version in terms of just yeah. sheer amazingness. There's, there's very too- little other ways I can describe it, except it's just amazing. And it's a great it's transition for hopefully the next box set that we're getting. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I do, to an extent, understand why they put it on here because um, there's a the, line, the lineage of Marcella as a song, melody-wise, goes all dressed up for school 
from like, what was that? 64 ish, something like that. 63, 64 yeah. to, um, I think it is, I just got my pay. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, then it becomes Marcella. Normally I'm like, yes, it was, I just got my pay, but like, there's so many songs I'm trying to keep track of in my brain. <laughs> I'm just going through yeah, all this. Yeah. I'm like, wait, it is that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, so that's the lineage. You Need a Mess of Help to Stand Alone. I really, really love that song. It's really underrated. Um, it's interesting, of course, hearing the backing track and the vocals that are, uh, kind of muddy on the final mix, you know, the backing vocals, it's kind of hard to clearly hear, although you hear it, but like, it's there, but like, it's just mud. I really hope that they remix Carl and the Passions, because I think that's an album that really could use a good, re oh, we were talking earlier about. Well, that, love... yeah, that in Holland, actually, so um, another shout out here to uh, Les Hastings, who, does great remixes of Beach Boys songs. Um, he put out a lot of remixed Carl and the pa or Holland tracks and Carl and the Passions tracks to try to improve their sonic quality and you know really like give them a facelift almost. And he was talking about this. Um, I read his posts on social media about like his process, and it's like, wow, you never realize like how sonically subpar some of this stuff is until a person like him goes in deals with that stuff and then out of that process comes a much better sounding version i totally agree yeah um i really i really really wish and i don't think it exists i'm pretty sure that this has been confirmed in multiple places i really wish a version of beatrice from baltimore was recorded with those original lyrics because Beatrice from Baltimore, that was, that became, you, you need a mess of help to stand alone. Oh, they, okay. they re wrote a completely different set of lyrics for, for this, which is why it became, you need a mess of, st of help to stand alone. But originally different lyrics entirely. It was called Beatrice from Baltimore. And there is a cool little, um, I don't know where the, what the source for this was, but on Smiley Smile, somebody posted a snippet of like reportedly what part of the original lyrics were. And I don't, I don't want to dig through it right now because it would take too long to bring that info up because I have to like dig a little bit for it, as I just said. But um, I was reading those lyrics and I'm like, I can imagine this instantly, what this would sound like. Because it's not a, a leap at all. You know yeah. exactly where in the song it fits. It's a verse lyric and the melody is the same as you, you need a mess of help to stand alone. But unfortunately, I don't think any of the original lyrics survive but we'll see. Maybe I'll be proved we'll wrong. See, yeah. That would be really year. cool. I didn't know that existed. That's super awesome. Yeah. And you need a mess of help to stand alone. Also then morphed into it's okay. It's literally the, it's just a reworked melody that's designed to have Mike sing the lead. Yeah. So it's always interesting to like see the evolution and hear the evolution of certain tracks. Absolutely. So that concludes the track by track uh, discussion pretty much between you and I. And um, really quick, I wanna talk about the physical packaging of the set and the various physical additions and things like that. And talk about the liner notes. So you only have the vinyl copy of, yeah. the, of the set. The vinyl copy does come with a book. And honestly, like because I have both, I can confirm. The actual contents of the books between versions seems to be the same. So content wise, you're not missing it out on anything by just getting the vinyl if you didn't get the CD version or vice versa. Um, what's different I think and why there's a page difference between the two is just like the, the credits, like the track by track credits. Okay. There's more to go through on the, the five cd version so i think that's it mostly uh i have not really done a one-to-one -one comparison but somebody asked me um like actually a bunch of people asked me and, and not a bunch but like several people asked me 
um, what the difference between the, the books were, because I always knew from just Mark Lynette posting a smiley smile about this, that the books are different. Yeah. But they're not different in any kind of way that I would describe as important, meaning actual content. But yeah. listen, so this is a beautiful set physically. What do you think of the, the, the artwork by chance? Oh my God, are you kidding me? It's incredible. He posted something, I remember Dylan about a year Carson. ago on, on the Beach Boys Reddit that was similar to this. Uh, it wasn't exact, but it was, I remember it being like, this would be so cool for something. And here it is. Like, yep. it's awesome. It's great. I love it. I, so shout out to Dylan Carson, who is the artist who yeah, drew this. Awesome. Um, he's really great. You can find him on Instagram. I follow him. Uh, and a great artist and i do like his work as the cover for something like this when i first saw this i was a little bit underwhelmed i i didn't dislike it i also didn't like it it's just not what i was expecting and it's grown on me since then the thing about it is and i i point this out to certain people who i speak with about you know this set online and have spoken with it's eye-catching it catches your eye. And that's the biggest thing about this. You know, we could have gotten like a very surfs up esque cover to go along with the title of field flows, but I don't know if that truly captures everything in the set, Yeah. Vibe wise. And it's definitely not as eye catching as something like this. I think it's but a testament to, to the new direction they're taking with this and how seriously they're taking this box set the contrast between the last, the I'm going your way EP where it's just black and white text. It's and it looks awful that cover. So, dude, so who threw it's that? It's not a cover. Like it's, in 30 seconds on Photoshop. It feels like a placeholder cover. Yeah. It doesn't even feel like, like a placeholder. It doesn't feel like anything. It's like literally just cover art comes to white. Them. That's yeah. it. For, to go from that to this gorgeous image. Yeah. It's like, I mean, what do I say? It's fantastic. And he's a, he is a great artist and definitely he put out some stuff on his Instagram of like some alternate version that he did that was surfs up related. Yeah, I saw really that. Cool. I love that. Yeah. But at the same time, I understand why they went with this. If you were to ask me which cover do I like better, do I like the surfs up one he did or this one? Uh, I'm going to go with the surfs up. I like that better by <laughs> a good amount, but I also like this. I, I, this has grown on me. Still not a huge fan of it. I, I Part of that also has to do with like the, what I was expecting. We've heard about this set for like, you know, two plus years now. And there was great anticipation. You know, a lot of hardcore fans were anticipating this. And then when this gets unveiled, I, I, I just wasn't expecting it. And when you're not expecting something, either you're that winds up being very good or very bad, but I don't think it was either in this case. It was just like, it's nice, but it's yeah. not what I would have expected. But it's, it, I, I do like it. Um, I'm into it, man. I, I want to just say, I hope, I don't know if it'll happen, but we'll see because they got, they somebody found this guy online and saw his artwork and said this would be perfect. I would love to see Favorite Vegetable do some artwork for a, for a Carl and the Passions release. I think that would be amazing. Yes. Uh, Matt, as his, his, his awesome name is, is, he is amazing. Yeah. And uh, I second and third that suggestion. Yeah. That needs to happen. We gotta, oh, since we're on the subject matter, though, hold on. I want to show like the Surf Sub shirt that he made. Uh, he made you like a custom shirt, right? Yes, he did. In fact, there, there's a reprint that he's he's doing of this shirt upcoming, and it's blue. But it's blue because I suggested that when he was custom making mine, that blue be the color. He was like, what do you want as the color? And I picked Carolina blue because I thought it would look good. But And also, like the reason I reached out to him about this is because I like long-sleeved. I prefer long-sleeved shirts to short-sleeved. But like, look at this. This is incredible. That's awesome, man. That's um, so freaking cool. Yeah, I know. He absolutely 
needs. He, he I'm needs speaking to, it in he a, needs to, to work in some capacity with like the yeah. artwork for the band. I feel like mo moving forward, just just do it. He's talented, yeah. very talented. Sure. Um, but yeah, I do have a couple of observations slash one complaint about uh, the physical packaging. Well, actually two. Um, okay. One is, and this isn't a complaint, but you know, on the CD version. The, the liner notes, the book. Okay, you very much think that, you know, you see all this writing here, great pictures, of course, but there's a lot of white space here. And honestly, when you read through this, this uh, these liner notes, which are entirely written by Howie Edelson, Edelson who's, you know, and he's majorly like responsible for the set and deserves a ton of props. But when you read this, well, you get a snapshot of this time period for the band, and he, he rightfully points out some interesting stuff, like, you know, there's this uh, kind of disconnect between what the Beach Boys were experiencing and doing on stage versus what they were doing at home in the studio musically, and which is an interesting observation. I think, like, a lot of people don't think about that stuff um, when it comes to, like, listening to this material and trying to think of it in its time frame because you don't really necessarily automatically think of like, what were the live shows like then? Um, and how strange some of it is like to compare, but um, there's a lot of white space. It, it, although it captures like what that time was like for the band, it also doesn't have that much to say. Hmm. And that's my, my one complaint about the liner notes is that I really wish there were more details about the actual music, not that there aren't some, but compared to the, like the amount of music that we get here versus what is written in here, like the amount of what is written in here about it, yeah. there's a big gap. Like there's might not I, a ton of info. Might I suggest the Sunflower issue of End the Summer Quarterly. And the Surf's Up version as well. And, and the Surf's Up issue. Yeah. Which are both Excellent companion pieces to this box set. I second and third that. Oh, and by the way, this lyric sheet for, uh, I don't know if you can see that with the glare, but this is the original Carl Wilson Surf's Up, uh, Surf's Up lyric sheet that he made. And I talk about this in my video on the history of Surf's Up's lyrics, but uh, Carl did not have access to the original lyric sheets that Van Dyke Parks wrote. So basically what he did was he listened to Brian singing the uh, demo version from late 1966 and he transcribed what he thought Brian was singing. But in some cases, he probably changed stuff on purpose. And Stephen Desper has said he changed certain stuff on purpose. But you can see all like physically what he wrote here. And it's really, really fascinating. And I actually added a, a portion to um, the PDF document that I utilized in the video that I, I made about the lyrics, but also like you can view that uh, document itself. Like I made updates since the video yeah. um, to it. And it's just really interesting here because there's a number of aspects on it uh, about it that uh, I was not expecting to be true. But then there were other ones that I already knew about. For example, uh, years ago, like Stephen Desper pointed something out on one of the threads on Smiley Smile about how Carl misspelled the word baton as B-A-T-A-A-N. <laughs> it was Brian who wrote the O over the two A's saying Carl is spelled this way. <laughs> but I think with the, also it's cool to see this just because at the end, if you look at the picture, which I don't want to hold it up just because you probably wouldn't see it anyway, but in faint pencil on the second page, you can see the line that Brian eventually like asked to be removed from the end tag. It was written for the end tag. And then he later said, don't put that in. Um, and that's what happened. But this is not a new discovery. Uh, like was, we, people have known movie? about this line. So the line is actually um, in the end tag where, you know, how, how it's uh, a children's song. If you, has you had a children's song, have you listened as they play their song is love and the children know the way. So there's another line there that's gonna that was supposed to be sung towards the end of, you know, the end tag that goes, 
the father's life is done and the children carry on. And you can actually see that line in this picture of the original document. Wow. Really faint, but it's there. It's like the last line written. So if you have your copy. I was just going to say, I wonder if it's in the vinyl. It is. I believe it is still is in that version of the book. But you can literally see it right there. And we've, people have known about this line for years because it actually was like something that existed on Surf's Up Wikipedia page for like a very long time. And then somebody removed it because there was no source. So, you know, without a source, yeah, it's probably going to get removed. But it was on there for a very long time before it got removed. So like, this is not like new information. It's not a new discovery. It's been known about for years. Um, and now we actually see it, which is awesome. While you're looking for that, um, another thing, and this is a preference. I just want to preface this by saying this is a preference, but I really miss the style of box set that isn't like this, like a book, but an actual box box, like the Pet Sounds uh, sessions mm. from 19, uh, 1997, the original Good Vibrations box set from 93. I yeah. like that style a lot better than the Pet Sounds 50th anniversary set from 20, uh, 2016. And this, I don't know, I just, I understand why they're not going back to that design but I, that doesn't mean I like it. I, I don't, I prefer, I strongly prefer like an actual box to this uh, style. I yeah. I think it depends on the thing though. And I, I think it's the product of the time, but I appreciate consistency and I don't like when they're not consistent. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the non-consistency serves a purpose, I don't mind that. So like, you know, the smile sessions box at the full five CD version mm -hmm that being like not the same style as the one that, as the box sets before it, that I can get behind because that serves a purpose, what they did with that. Yeah. This, uh, I, I can't list a tangible reason other than maybe it's just easier to make the, it this style. But in terms of actual functionality, I, I can't really actually pinpoint why. Yeah. Why they start making the style now. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I want to say about the physical, uh, the physical box, which is a physical book, pretty much like just another thing. It feels weird to say, Oh, it's a box set. This is not a box. I know it, I, technically, yeah, it's a box set, but it's not a box. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really like this, but in some ways, I feel like it could have been a little better. But that's just my opinion. Um, the, the vinyl version comes with this 12 by 12 poster. Yeah. Which I usually like my posters to be a little bit more sizable, but I do like this. I will hang it at some point. Um, and then do you have anything to add to that? Like your thoughts? Well, I, I know I had said this earlier, but since we're talking about the actual physical media, I'm going to just reiterate this. The whole, I still think putting Sunflower and Surf's Up proper on this box set on the physical releases was kind of a mistake. I would rather have used that space for all the bonus stuff that's on that fifth disc that we didn't get. Like, I, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. as someone that predominantly listens to music on vinyl and like, once as much Beach Boys stuff. I, I I pride myself on having all of the Beach Boys material on vinyl with the exception of Summer in Paradise and Stars and Stripes, but it's a whole different conversation. Um, but I it drives me crazy that there are songs from this box set that aren't on the vinyl, that are on the CD and are on the digital versions. It frustrates me, especially because I feel like, and again, I know I'm repeating myself, the people that are buying this already have Surf's Up and Sunflower. We yeah. already own this stuff, especially because they're such great albums. It's not like an MIU box set where it's like, well, maybe they don't have it because it's not that good of an album. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like we have Surf's Up because it's an amazing record. I would rather, I don't know, but, and, and the whole having one or two bonus tracks at the end of the side to interrupt the flow of the album. Who yeah, thought that, that was that's a terrible idea. I mean, they want to cram as much stuff onto it as possible, but 
when you really break it down, it, it's also not a great act to do yeah. that. You know? It's like they're, they're like, putting it on the album so you can listen to the album and experience it that way. But at the same time, we're not even getting the proper way to experience it. So there's really no good reason to have these full albums on there other than to just sell us the same thing again. Well, that and also I think their main mindset is that they're thinking about new people. Like, let's say a, a person who has never experienced these albums before is only very vaguely aware of the Beach Boys, stumbles upon the vinyl version of Feel Flows somewhere and decides to pick it up. What decides is the reaction going to be? On it. What? <laughs> like, oh, I'll just drop a hundred dollars on something I don't know. Uh, I know this sounds ridiculous, like cost. I know we're but we're playing a hypothetical the, game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like they're thinking of that scenario. They're thinking, okay, this is a, a tool to make new fans and to potentially convert. I'm fine with that, but then fans. then give make it a six LP box set. I I think if you're if if you're already getting me to pay a hundred dollars for a four LP box set, I'll pay a little extra for a little more. Like you've already got my yeah. money. No, I, I I don't think it's a I am not defending it. I am actually, actually on their side. Yeah. I'm just trying to think from their perspective as For like sure. the makers of this box set. Why did they do that? And my answer to that is, well, probably because they're thinking of situations like that, where yeah. if a random Joe person, Joe Schmo, whomever were to buy this and expect like to know like an album and instead they get like all these outtakes that are just randomly placed pretty much without context, what do you think the reaction may be? And I don't think it would be bad. I just think the, the reaction would be maybe a little bit confused. To me, the solution to that would be you do your one LP landlocked thing for beginners or people that don't know the Beach Boys where it's like, here's a bunch of, here's the best of, they do that with, um, with like the Bob Dylan bootleg series where like, here's the 12 CD version. It's every single possible take of this song. And then also here's like a curated version of like the best of, of this collection of archival material. So you don't have to sift through 25 takes of like a Rolling Stone. It's like, I would rather something like that where it's like, here is the best of the best here. Here's the best of feel flows. And here's the whole thing for people that want to go either route, which is I guess why they have the two LP and the two CD but at that point, I don't know. I don't know where I'm getting at. I just. I, I think I understand what you're getting at. I'm nitpicking though. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, yeah. I mean, when you really get down to it, the majority of buyers are people who already know how amazing this stuff is. But yeah. I really do think that that's part of the reason why they just included the, the original albums is because yeah. of those random situations, however uncommon they may be. But it, it still doesn't make sense. It's like, who is your primary market here? People who already own the, the LPs proper and are buying this for the other stuff. But, so let's give them the LPs yeah. anyway, like a 12th time <laughs> in a row. So well, having, having said what I said, I am so glad that this exists. And it warms my heart to hold it in my hands and to listen to it. And to know that after two years, we are finally getting this box set and that it's successful and it's sold a lot and people care about it and sure. that we're going to hopefully get more. Like this is an exciting time. So we've got this, you know, the anniversary is coming up next year. Who knows what's going to happen with that? You know, I, I would love to see Blondie and Ricky come back for if they're going to do this like TV special, they've been talking about get Blondie and Ricky up there, especially now because I, I you can kind of justify oh you know this 50th anniversary everyone was kind of doing their own thing it's like Blondie is a part of of Brian and Al's band now like in the way that Paul Von Meters and Darian Sahanaja and those guys were a part of his band and they were incorporated into the celebration uh for the 50th anniversary Blondie is not only a member of their touring band he's a beach boy he should be there so yeah, no I agree I, I am excited for the future whatever the future holds if it's vr in western recordings fine i don't care let's 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 get the beach boys restaurant going again the beach boys cafe or whatever they called it um preach it preach it but bro. whatever bro. i just want more of this because this is good and people are caring about the beach boys again and that is never a bad thing I can't add anything else to what you just said. <laughs> I just, you summed it up right there. I, I just also, also say like, congratulations to uh, the Beach Boys themselves and also 
Mark, Alan, um, Howie, everybody who was involved in the making of this box set for it charting. And, yeah. you know, it, it, it was 83 on the U S charts. It was uh, 19 on the UK charts. Part of me thinks it could have it, it wanted to do a little bit better on the, the U S charts. I think probably most of us would say that, but that needs to, you know, you, you need to keep, keep in mind pretty much that these this stuff is like 50 years old okay so like 83 on the u.s charts for stuff that is half a century old it's pretty impressive still yeah so like you know just keep that in mind i feel like because it's impressive it's also slightly underwhelming when you think about it but it's not underwhelming when you think about it also it's it's all about what you compare it to, really. Um, the eighty three is a very very respectable number for something like this. I mean, when were the when was the last time, other than the reunion album, obviously, when was the last time the Beach Boys were on the charts? I was actually going through this um, with uh, my father and a friend of his. Um, let me bring up that message because I did text them this. It wasn't Summer in Paradise, I'll tell you that. Oh. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, here we go. For comparison's sake, the Smile Sessions peaked at number 27 in 2011, so did really well, really actually, well. when you think about it for something that old. Yeah. Um, although, in my opinion, should have done even better. Um, that's why God Made the Radio peaked at number three. These are all the U.S. charts, by the way, for anybody like listening to this. Um, number 94 was the live album from the anniversary, the 50th reunion, the live. Oh, auto-tune the album. <laughs> yeah, that, that made number 94, amazingly. I, I always, because I listen to that album every now and again, I have a I have a love of that period of the Beach Boys because that's when I got into them was the right. 50th anniversary. There, I was listening to that album about two weeks ago, and there is the the version of "Don't Back Down" from that live album. Mike's auto tuned as hell on that whole thing, but that track specifically is like embarrassing. Cause when he goes to the not my boys, like that low part, it's like the auto tune is just like freaking out. It doesn't know which note to go to, but it's like buried because it's like low in the mix. And then all the other vocals are going. So like Joe Thomas must have like known. He's like, we don't have time to to better track this auto tune. So let's just bury it in the mix. It's like he they're allowed to hit bum notes. They're a, a million years old. Like it's okay. As both it, both you and I know, having been to shows on that tour, yeah, he had a great live without any kind of effects. It's like just let them be. Like we just want to hear yeah. their voices. It doesn't have to be the greatest performance in the world perfect. per se. It just has to yeah. be genuine and good and a representation of what those shows were like. And sadly, it didn't yeah. deliver on that. Also, by the way, as another like a last little like comparison, and I was shocked when I saw this on the site that I got this from, uh, you know the fanzine that came out before the tour started with the 2011 or 2012 Do It Again remake? That was yeah, like yeah, yeah. Tour. Exclusively available at Walmart. Yep. Guess what? It charted. <laughs> that charted? I was shocked when I saw it. It charted at number... It charted at number 86. And now it's out of print. Now it's out of print, but that charted at number 86. Weird. Gil Flows charts at number 83. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Mind blowing. Um, in, not, in not a good way. Um, for, in this sense, it's like, what? How? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's still a great accomplishment. And uh, there's a lot more to come. Uh, and we'll be obsessively buying it for as long as they put it out. Release Hard Time. That's an amazing song. If you if you make it, we will buy it. And it's they know all you need to know. Mark, Alan, the Beach Boys, if you make it, we will buy it. 
Well, unless it's Summer in Paradise, then we then we won't really. Oh, no, I'll buy that. <laughs> put Summer in Paradise on vinyl. Put Stars and Straight. How the only way to get that album on vinyl is to buy the South Korean promo versions that are like two thousand dollars. I don't have two thousand dollars. All right, I yeah, want that yeah. album on vinyl. It's the only one I don't have. Anybody got two thousand dollars to to spare? Or to go fund me? <laughs> no, I don't even. Whatever. I, this is this is a whole, we can do a whole episode on this. Yeah, I mean, well, maybe we'll do this again potentially if uh, if there's Love interest. To, yeah. But I really, really enjoyed this, and I appreciate you, DJ, yeah. for joining me to do this. Thank I, you for uh, asking me to do this. I'm really, really glad we did. Likewise, um, and yeah, I actually have my fingers crossed that we'll get to do this again. Um, and yeah, uh, to all our viewers, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we will be around for, like, on our YouTube pages. Uh, we'll post this. Check out DJ, his YouTube page, his social media. Te check out Rattleshake. Again, great band. Really should check them out. They're on Spotify if you're curious. Um, and stay tuned for more content from both of us. Have a good one. Peace.